Welcome back to the Gun Culture Radio Show. And as I always try to remind you guys, the um, the uh, link uh, to the uh, to the podcast where you can download it on Lipsum is in the uh, description. And uh, I'll try not to uh, forget to put it in there this time. And uh, as you may notice, it's actually uh, been a, a, a two weeks since I did the last show. Well, I actually recorded one uh, last weekend. I didn't have a guest or anything, just by myself. And I forgot to do the uh, the album recommendation. So, I, and I was busy with the holidays and, and everything. And I didn't end up going back through it and doing that. And it never uh, posted it. Um so that so that one I'll I'll try to get up at, at some at some time. I'm not sure exactly when I'll I'll post it, uh, but whenever I go back and do the album recommendation, you know I'll let you know that that's the one that it is. It's the one that I recorded uh, beforehand, and uh, I'll get that one posted uh, sometime. But uh, but uh, this time I actually um, have a guest, and um, he is uh, a very uh, very distinguished guest. He is a brilliant mind and the best shot of all time not only that he is blessed with an amazing level of um what's uh what's that perspicacity perspicacity what's that mean uh very perceptive okay um so yeah and uh you may also know him as hickok 45 hey good to be here john (laughs) how you doing good (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> this is quite a professional studio here. I, I'm uh, I'm pleased to to be here. This is not exactly uh, the way I do things when I record something and put on the on the channel. This is really cool. You got nice microphones and everything. Yeah, it's a little upgrade from the uh, recorder. <laughs> <laughs> quite <laughs> amazing uh, difference, actually. Yeah, still need to get more um, soundproofing stuff in here. That's the one thing that I'm missing, and. Uh, Zeke actually had a uh, great idea. He said I should take um, like the foam out of gun boxes <laughs> and put them up. I think we have a few of those. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we probably do. <laughs> now Zeke, now Zeke, is that a character from Hee Haw? Um, no, it's that. What's that show called? Um, Talking Heads. Oh, or talking, walking, walking, lead, walking lead, talking lead, or something. Oh, talking oh, lead. Yeah, talking it. lead. Yeah. Okay. When I hear Zeke, I always think of uh, somebody in bib overalls and uh, with a straw in their mouth oh okay. uh, yeah. Okay. yeah i think i know that guy yeah yeah speaking of uh perspicacity something he uh lacks totally right right yeah <laughs> that's right but um yeah this is a neat well you know what that tapestry ought to absorb some sound yeah it does yeah the beatles tapestry you guys have seen it in the pictures it uh yeah it does and i've got the uh of course the they live reference thing that that makes a that makes a difference it's like a huge tarp basically yeah. Yeah. um which uh, that's just a reference to a movie that I like, and I thought thought it would be cool because I was trying to think of something really big that I could put up in this room that wouldn't cost me an arm or leg. So I just made that, and um, you know I need to put up a few more things, but it's not too bad. It's not bad. There's a little bit of echo in here, but it's not too bad. It's pretty cool. That that tapestry uh, is funny. Uh, we didn't even talk about it, but uh, just sitting here facing it uh, takes me back to my classroom. I don't know if you've ever told the uh, your listeners. But uh, I had the ta- that tapestry uh, purchased probably wow around year two thousand or before, and uh, and hung that in my classroom. Kids loved it, and uh, I uh, when I gave up the task of teaching, I uh, just told John he could have that if he wanted it, and here it hangs. So I'm glad to see it being put to good use. And uh, maybe we can talk about that tapestry at some point. There's some interesting stories relating to that Abbey Road album. As you yeah. Probably know. Yeah. Yeah. There really is. Of course, all the, all the stuff about uh, Paul being dead and uh, all that kind of stuff, you yeah, know, all the symbolism. And uh, yeah, I mean, there is a, it's funny. I actually ever watched a bunch of YouTube videos on that one night and um, it kind of, it's, it, it's weird because there is a lot of symbolism that has to do with like death and all these different kinds of things. And some of their, Things and, and uh, I believe Paul was in a car accident sometime around that time. And what it seems like to me maybe happened is that they uh, they may have there may have actually been a scare where they thought maybe he wasn't going to pull through or something like that, and it just never became like a big um, thing in the media because they wanted to keep it more you know to themselves uh, for the family's sake. And he pulled through, and then they were just kind of having fun with it. Maybe like some of the conspiracy theories cropped up beforehand about him being dead so then they were just kind of having fun with it or something yeah um but you know of course i'm sure that somehow 
uh, Paul was replaced with someone equally talented. <laughs> <laughs> he looked just like him. <laughs> it looked just like him. I'm sure that happened. <laughs> I know. Well, I had a I had an article uh, uh, posted on the wall in my classroom. Beside that, and I used to use that as an example too. How uh, and, and you know I don't know. I, it's been so long since I actually read since I actually read the article that I had posted. And I don't really recall what uh, magazine I had pulled it from, but uh, it. Uh, the gist of it was, yeah, you know, there was so 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 much symbolism. There were so many, uh, I don't know, conspiracies and everything that came out of that that picture, that album cover, you know, down uh, to the the numbers on the Volkswagen license tag, yeah, and just everything. And of course, you know, got Lennon wearing white, and the rest of the guys yeah. wearing black. It's to the and, point where I think it yeah. is intentional. I don't think it yeah. means that Paul was dead. But I think no. it was intentional, probably. Well, I think, in that, as I recall, I wish I had that in front of me. The article was, uh, the, the guys, what was funny, it struck me so much. They were they were just sitting in the studio. It's, I think it's right outside uh, their, their recording studio, Abbey Road. They got a call from their manager or somebody and said, hey, we need a, or whoever does their album covers or whatever. And, and uh, they said, hey, man, we, we got to get this picture. We're behind or schedules, you know, tight. And we got to get, we got a photograph for the album cover. Yeah. And it basically just kind of whatever they're wearing or could throw on, they just went out on the road real quick. They got there with a the camera. They got a picture for the cover and bang, bang, that, that was kind of it. And yeah. so, so, so much of it was just read into it. Yeah. But, but then there's, there's stuff there that yeah. has things you can read yeah. into. It. It, easily. Well, it, the way my take on it is the, the reason I think that, like I don't think Paul is dead. Like I don't think that he's dead. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but um, but I do think that it, the reason I think that some of the st- symbolism was intentional and it was designed is not just because if it was just this album alone, then I would just crop that up to just mm-hmm. you know coincidence. But in a bunch of their albums afterwards, there's also like similar yeah. symbolism. So it's kind of like they just I think they were just having fun with it. You know, they just fun. letting it go. But supposedly, what I've heard is like like. John, the way he's dressed, is supposed to be like the divine, and then Ringo is the undertaker, and then, of course Paul is dead because he has no shoes. That's right. And then George is the grave digger or something like that. Yeah, but of course they were just sitting around. They went outside and did it. But, but yeah. then again, Paul took his shoes off for some reason, probably, and and John probably changed clothes to be. Yeah. Who knows? And the thing you have to remember is like the Beatles were highly, highly intellectual, creative yes. people. So they would have they would have gotten a lot of pleasure, I think, out of playing with society, messing with they their would. heads, you know, oh, and stuff would. like that. And, so, and they were very uh, and they were fun loving. They were always playing tricks on people. They loved yeah. to have fun, prank. You know? Right? Yeah, exactly. But it was more impromptu than most people, I think, think it was. But anyway, I, I just was noticing that. Thought that. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny we talked about some things we could talk about we didn't yeah. talk about that at all no we but didn't. as you're getting the recording going i was sitting here looking at that thing oh man that's neat i kind of missed that in my classroom all those years but yeah uh, it's neat i really like having it up here i need to get another one uh so, you know some other kind of cool tapestry to put in here yeah get a metallica one or something but um well we could we could make a hickok 45 and oh yeah a, that's right you could have a picture of me you know about 10 by 10 on the wall like, yeah really i mean Gosh, wouldn't you like to have a picture of your dad on the wall? Yeah. Gigantic right. picture. Yeah, I mean, there's <laughs> just like all the posters that are in the house, that's right. you know, of, of you and everything. That's right. and, you know, so. But, yeah. uh, man, I know one thing, I was, uh, something else I was thinking about the other day. I, I mean, I think about this a lot, honestly. Uh, well, not not a lot, but it's something that, it, that seems like a recurring issue is uh, – uh, the mentality of people that are involved in in uh, gun sales, the people who are selling guns um, in you know, shop situations, are mainly just yeah people who are working gun shops and who are working booths and gun shows, which of course are gun shops usually. Uh, also, it's um it seems like that you know it's and also it's not just guns. Sometimes it seems like it's almost like business one hundred and one that if you're not rude to someone who you're doing a business deal with or cold to them, then you're going to get somehow taken advantage of. And I don't, I don't get that mentality, you know, and that's the mentality. A lot of times, like, you know, I've been at gun shows before and you know, you'll walk up, you'll be holding a gun or something. You'll be talking to them and you know, then they're real nice and everything. But the second that you mention something about a trade or a sell or whatever, or that you want, even if you want to buy something at a the table, then immediately like a flips, a uh, switch flips, mm-hmm. and they have to take on this tough guy persona. 
Really? Yeah. I've never noticed that. Really? <laughs> Maybe you're one of them. <laughs> yeah, that's one of my pet peeves, too. And uh, I guess we probably talked about that. Uh, Can't talk about it enough, but, though. Oh, man. We, it, it needs to be shouted from the rooftops. Uh, you, you, think, you would think that people who are in the, the gun business would get the message eventually. But they, they, they never, they never seem to. Uh, some of them. I mean, there are a lot of, uh, obviously, to, to qualify it. There are a lot of great gun shops where they're very friendly places to oh, walk yeah. into. They're great places to buy to just talk guns. Uh, well, like, you, there's one I'd like to call out because yeah. these guys. There's a gun shop. It's on. Uh, it's on Charlotte Pike in Nashville. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's it called? Uh, Sporting Arms, I think. I think so. Yeah. It's like kind of not far from the Walmart on Charlotte Pike, and those right. guys have always been. Now, traditionally, they the the people who owned it before, not right. necessarily the case. They're just the opposite. Yeah, yeah. The guys who are in there now, though, uh, great, great people. I mean, I always have a great experience when I go in there. Always. Yeah. Not something I can be said for for <laughs> other shops that I've that I've been into. Yeah. But anyways, continue. But. Well, yeah, no, yeah. Well, since we're mentioning them, I mean, we we don't. Uh, well, well, little shops tend to be a little better. It depends on the size, where it is, and what it is. Of course, we get the uh, the little shop in uh, in Pleasant View, Tennessee, checks in our guns for us. Great people, oh, Elks, yeah. Elks Outdoors. Yeah. they do a great great job. They, they don't have a lot of inventory. But uh, just uh, you know, nice little shop, and and the guy will order anything you want. Really, really helpful, Jim, and uh, ships our guns in for us, a very minimal price, and uh, that kind of thing. But uh, Guns and Leather, another shop. I don't know if I've ever been in Guns and Leather over in uh, Greenbrier, and then what Hendersonville or Nashville. Yeah. Uh, both both their locations where. Yeah, you know, they weren't friendly yeah. and, and helpful, and acted like they were glad you came in. Uh, well, even Franklin Gun Shop, I was in there the other day, and I've gotten to know some of the folks that work in there. You know, I think one of the owners or two. They're they're very uh, they're very accommodating. I think most of the time they're the really busy. They're yeah. really busy. You know, I know because yeah. uh, experience is a little bit different now because people know about you know, the stuff exactly that we do, but. exactly as people recognize this, uh, it's 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 not as uh, I guess you'd say an authentic right. experience. Of course, we're always glad to be treated well, right? We're glad because yeah. that's the kind of treatment everybody should get in yeah. every gun shop. Yeah, you know, but uh, uh, but most of my life in collecting guns and shooting i i was not hickok 45 yeah and uh so i i know i know where the gun shops are that are that are rude but but yeah i i've never understood it when i first came to nashville in uh, the seven early 70s there was a shop that uh it's uh, sort of still in existence and it was the first thing i heard about it was when i asked where the gun shops are was well there's a pretty good shop they have a lot of a lot of guns and uh I said okay, but now they're not very friendly, and uh, everybody, everybody that you would talk to about the shop would have that same opinion. It's just there weren't as many choices at that time, and sure enough, they were right. Yeah, you know, you just didn't want to do business there, but you almost had to if you wanted to have some selection. Right. And I never understood it, and it didn't change for decades. Yeah. Same deal. Yeah, and what's like? What's the you know? What's the mentality behind that? You know, like. We all run into rude clerks and things. It just happens. But you're, you're working in a gun shop. Most of the time, people that work in a gun shop probably really like guns. <laughs> and they have the rare opportunity to have a job doing something that they really enjoy. They're, they get to be around something that they really like. Be like if you're just a car nut and you're involved in you know, selling cars or something. You know, And so they're in this environment that they really like and enjoy. And there's people coming in all the time that are like... They're brothers, you know, in a sense of other gun people that also like that and really enjoy that. And, and wh- like, why would they have a bad attitude? It just does not make any sense, except it does, because what happens is because guns are something that is used to defend ourselves, right? Uh, they're used as, uh, they can be used as weapons or tools or all these different things. They become this big, you know, manly, macho ego thing so Mm -hmm. you know because i have guns or i know things about guns that means that i have to impose my will onto other people you know yeah and i think that might be part of it with with some people of course it's hard to analyze you know everybody but i think sometimes 
it's just some grumpy old guy starts a gunshot. Yeah, He's, that too. Might have been rude his whole life to everybody. Yeah. Or some grumpy young guy. Uh, it's just their nature, and there's not a there's not a test. I always joke about how there there must be some sort of test that you have to take, like the ACT or something, in order to open a gun shop. And number one question is, uh, do you have the capability of being rude to most of your customers? And you've got to check yes, you know, yeah. or else you don't get your FFL. You just don't get yeah. the license. <laughs> But I don't know. It does. Uh, the thing is, uh, it does nothing for the Second Amendment. Well, yeah, actually, it does. It's it's a negative effect on yeah. the Second Amendment. Yeah. If they would just realize that, it, obviously, it does nothing for their business. But and 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 of course, it's the same with any business. You know, most of us we go in, and if we feel like people don't want to trade with us, or they they almost regret that we came through the door. If you get that, if you get that feeling in any business. You don't necessarily say anything, do you? Usually no. you don't. You just don't come back. Yeah, exactly. And then some of those very same shops, I'm sure they wonder where all their customers yeah. are. Why yeah. Why business is so slow. And maybe that's part of it. Maybe back. Uh, maybe it's going to be changing that there's more gun shops opening up now because the industry has gotten so much bigger. Maybe in the past it was because gun shops were so rare that they didn't they didn't really care because they knew people were going to come back anyways because there was they were like the only game in town that could be that's, part of it what's sad i think is that so many uh they really are a negative effect on the second amendment and uh, and getting new gun owners uh, involved because think about it how intimidating i know both of us have talked about this probably but how intimidating it must be because i've done shopping for camera gear or for uh computers well, things I might know something about, but I'm not as knowledgeable as I am about firearms. Or, you know, and things that change, technology, you're, you're shopping for it. But, you know, oh, man, I don't know who's making the best computer these days. You know, I used to know all about that, but maybe now I don't. And yeah. we were just talking about that. And so you have lots of questions, and you have to evaluate the person you're talking with. What's their agenda? Are they trying to sell you the computer with a better profit margin, or do they really know? And, you know, you just go through all that. With firearms, it's it's the uh, you know boy, if you know nothing about firearms, there's so much condescension there. Yeah, you know? they talk yeah. down to you and, and oh. all so much and exactly if you if you even hint or even seem like you might not know as much as them, it's like they swoop in. Yeah, you know like you know <laughs> not everybody, but in you know, in some no, shops. But yeah, that's know? how we're talking about the you know the bad ones, of course. Right, because I've been in shops where uh, in some of those we mentioned. Where you and I've just observed uh, as I'm looking around, uh, it, it, you know, someone asking a question, maybe some young lady, some young guy, some old guy. It's obviously they don't know much about it, and you will see clerks, owners actually asking the correct questions. You know, yeah. what, what's your experience, and what will you be using it for, and have you shot much? Yeah. Yeah, really, and letting them uh, test some different fire, pick them up at least, and they get the feel, and then they'll immediately direct them to the smallest, lightest gun or the prettiest gun if they're female. Or you see some people really doing it the right way, but you see a lot of people not doing it the right way. And and think about it. Well, I get a lot of we get messages, of course, every day, lots of them, <laughs> and uh, from people who who don't like going into gun shops, and they, they feel will intimidated. Yeah. They feel intimidated. And they'll tell me stories about how they just felt like they were uh, an idiot, you know, because they didn't know what they were looking for, and nobody seemed that interested in helping them or uh, helping them with their issue. And and you don't. Uh, it, what's weird is you don't tend to feel that way when you're going, like you said, you're going to look at a new laptop because yeah. they don't typically, you know, you don't know anything about laptops. A big deal. That's why you're there. Someone yeah. just you know showing you which ones to get. But at a gun shop, it's like. Uh, it is. It, it, they do kind of intimidate you in a way. If you if you walk in there and you're someone maybe who I've heard it so many times being in gun shops looking at stuff and you hear someone next to you come in and oh, I'm looking for this or that, you know, and then they start being really condescending and and they say things mm-hmm. that are just just flat wrong and whatever yeah. in any universe like those things. Some of the things I've heard are just so wrong, and uh, and they try to direct them in the ways of their personal bias or whatever is not selling and all these kinds of things and it's just. You know, I just really hate to see that, you know. I do, too. And, and in their defense, uh, I think there is a dynamic that takes – and I've talked to lots of owners. I've never worked in a gun shop, but I've spent a lot of time in them. But in their defense, uh, it's not really a, a, a good defense. But I know that they, too, the, the other side of the coin is so many people walk through the door who are know-it-alls. Yeah. And 
they come in there. You know, we've we've heard some of the people we've got yeah. close to that work in gun shops tell us stories. You know, the unsafe and, stuff. That yeah, happens and, the unsafe and the the and the they, and of course customers can be smart Alex too, where they can be those know it all people that come in there and, and tell them they're wrong when they actually do know something about firearms and and so they get a lot of that. They get a lot of that and they get jaded and they get people that come in there and want to trade a firearm that they bought for $400 a few years ago, yeah. and they expect the gun shop to pay them cash, 350 for it today, when that gun shop could order that gun today for 275 or 300 yeah. new and sell. You know, and They don't understand that concept, or, or they don't want to, that the firearm is only worth what someone's willing to pay for it, and once it's used, they have to sell it for whatever the price is, and that means they've got to give them whatever it is their profit margin they need 20 percent less or 50 percent you know whatever that might be or else they can just buy a new one you know right. sell it. so you got all those issues too but that's just part of being in business if you're selling yeah. computers or potatoes or tomatoes or or whatever that that's just part of it you know i i don't understand and again you 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 hit it on the head there sometimes you end up with that end up with that macho element that tough guy thing that persona that some shallow thinking people i think think they have to get into yeah. because they're in the gun business yeah. so and it becomes a, it becomes kind of a mexican standoff because oh because that guy feels like he has to be macho about guns well oh oh i have to match that or i'm going to seem like i'm not you know so it becomes this never ending cycle where people come into the gun shops with a macho attitude and assume to know things and then the clerks feel like they have to have this macho attitude to overcompensate for that you mm -hmm. know and then so when someone normal comes in there then you know then it becomes a mess that's right but that makes no sense john just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> I don't know if I can be nice to john even though we're on the radio you know yeah I mean, you know i still got to pick on him just like i did my students but uh yeah and that and that that kind of ties into you know this this business of uh People getting into guns, you know, I used to have a gun club where I taught, and one of the first things I would tell them the first day of our meetings was that there is nothing macho about firearms. And and I think that, unfortunately, and the reason I would bring that up is the fact that some people think there is something macho about firearms and having a big, powerful firearm and being able to carry a firearm or whatever. And you get into this... Uh, just one thing I like to say is that uh, you, you don't have to, to fall under this redneck, quote unquote, uh, scenario or stereotype because you're in the firearms world. Right. You know, and I'm afraid there are some people who do that and they, they feel like it is a macho thing. If, and that's scary it is. if someone is getting uh, a lot of power, you know, from having a fire. Now, no doubt a firearm, you know, is, is a powerful item and it does afford us power to protect ourselves right but some people seem to take that uh, almost in an offensive way yeah. you know yeah i've got this power now and i don't know if that's that's part of it but that's but you don't have to you know people need to avoid that kind of thinking altogether is my advice as i pontificate here and and give my two cents worth i just i just wish that you know i catch it because you all see it uh, and have seen comments about when I drove the Element. You know, I had a Honda Element for about, what, six years or something. Well, I drove a VW uh, Beetle for several years back in the early 70s. I, uh, a VW van, yeah, I was a hippie man. No, I didn't have flowers on the side of mine. But, but uh, and I've driven pickup trucks throughout those years and then the Volvos and just different cars. And you will see people. And I use that as an example. I'm not perfect either. Wait, when you just, when I, you had that van, did you go around <laughs> trying to solve uh, crimes of ghosts and uh, and things? Yeah, that's, that's right. That's good we do. That's right. Uh, yeah, I smuggled uh, marijuana, you know, across the border and and all that stuff. No, yeah. no, I, I I just say that to point out. I it has always bothered me that that people get into a certain stereotypical uh, life or world. It's, like a, it's a cultural and, trap, is what yeah. it is. Really, um, yeah. it's like there's little. Uh, it, like a like culture almost functions kind of like the universe basically you know like different cultural sects are almost like like planets and the gravity sucks people in yeah so once they get close to that little cultural pocket or whatever it is 
because they have uh, they bought a motorcycle or they have a big truck that's jacked up or they have a gun or whatever it is that they have that kind of brings them closer to some sort of little cultural pocket. Some, some group, yeah. Yeah, then you get, if you're not careful and you don't stay true to yourself, you get sucked in and it becomes, you get sucked in by the, the gravity of that cultural <laughs> trap, basically. And then it becomes a trap and then you basically encompass like all of the cultural values of that group that aren't really your own. They're, that's not even who you are and you think it is. And you walk through life being something else. That's exactly right, John. Very good. Very well put. Uh, man, you're pretty – who's your dad? <laughs> yeah, that, whoever he is, he, he must man. have uh, taught me pretty well. Yeah, you got some good training, didn't you? Uh, no, that's exactly right. You know, it, the motorcycle is a good analogy because uh, – or example, because, you, you know, we've seen it. You know, you know, you and I enjoy riding. Yeah. You know, got the Harleys, and that's fun. And I chose Harley. I, I looked at all kinds of motorcycles and thought about it. I had never really owned one, and – you sort of talked me into the Harley, and I thought, you know, I've had some, oh, I don't know, uh, quite a few cars, the vehicles that were made overseas, and, and uh, if there is such a thing anymore. But uh, I think I'll just get a Harley. You know? yeah. What the heck? I'm not going to, you know, they don't have maybe as good a reputation as some some of the rice burners. <laughs> I don't yeah. know. But who cares? There's a Harley shop on every corner. They look cool. They sound cool. Fun. Yeah, they're neat. They're cool. Uh, let me get an old cranky Harley. be fun. And, and I've enjoyed it. But, uh, but yeah, some people, oh, I've got a Harley. Let's see now. Uh, I, I remember reading on a forum when I first got it. I was trying to learn more about it. Some guy said he was going to get a Harley, but he didn't want to have to look like it. Was it Jack Sparrow? Was that the – the character in the Pirates of the Caribbean. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, that uh, What's his face? Who's the actor uh, we like? Uh, oh, Johnny Depp. Right? Yeah, Johnny yeah. Depp. I love Johnny Depp. Great actor. But uh, he didn't want to have, he didn't want to feel like he had to dress like Jack Sparrow yeah. every time he got on it. You know, and that's yeah. kind of what, and now I have learned too, though. I mean, that does fall in. You you, you get sucked in by that culture, by that group. You got to do this, got to wear that, and, and you got to talk like this. You got to act tough, look tough, or whatever. But, but, but I did also learn, on the other hand, with uh, that there's a reason for a lot of the things. I always thought people wore leather just because it was cool. You know, if they were on yeah. a motorcycle, I didn't realize it was just the opposite, keep you warm yeah. and also to protect you. There are a lot of things and a lot of the trappings of that that actually are are uh, sensible and have yeah. purpose, you know. But you do, like you buy a Harley, then you feel like you have to yeah. meet that stereotype. Like whenever I got my bike, I remember thinking, oh, I'm going to go to bike nights. I'm going to do all this stuff and hang out with, you know, mm-hmm. other bikers and all this kind of stuff. and get to know people who ride and all that. I haven't been to one bike night. Since I got, it's like once <laughs> yeah. I kind of started to kind of get what, I mean, bikers are fine. They're all, they, you know, a lot of, most of them are good people. It's like, there's only that 1%, you know, it's actually really, it's less than that really, you know, the, right. the, the, the outlaw bikers. Um, but the thing I, like, I don't have a problem with them. The thing I kind of realized is like, just cause I have a Harley, I don't really necessarily have that much in common with, with the typical, uh, of bikers. Exactly. You know, I'm not. I don't necessarily enjoy just always hanging out at bars and drinking all the time and stuff like that. It's not really who I am. <laughs> you right. know, so I don't do that. <laughs> you know, right. I mean, I might do that on occasion. You know, go, mm-hmm. I, you know, I go to bars sometimes, but that's not who I am. I'm not a guy who hangs out at bars all the time. You know, so I don't do that. But I love riding my Harley. I absolutely love yeah. it. Yeah, exactly. It's such a, a, a yeah. I mean, that is right. I mean, you like to ride. It's fun riding it. Yeah, and, and I do too. It's just it's great. But it. It means nothing beyond that. I, yeah, I, I may I may not even like most writers. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know that many. And uh, you do get that, and even in like you go into the Harley shops and stuff, mm-hmm. you do get that macho, tough guy yeah. element in there. Yeah, and it, it really it really annoys me. It's, it's a turn off. It is yeah. a turn off, and it's the same with everything. I, I, I guess. I mean, I'm not much of a joiner in a lot of ways. Who was it? Will Rogers said I wouldn't want to be a member of any organization that would have me. Yeah, you know, I guess great. that's kind of the way I, I feel about it. You know, when I was teaching, I you know, for a lot of my career was teaching. I did other things, but I never really felt like uh, I didn't even want to join the teachers' unions. I never did really. I didn't. I didn't. Uh, I, I hung out with people I liked who taught, but I, I didn't. I just wasn't. I was just someone who enjoyed teaching. Uh, yeah. I'll, you know, but when I played basketball, I played basketball for a lot of years and at the college level was fairly successful. I I never really uh, considered myself a a basketball player. Uh, I, I I wasn't eaten up with it. Yeah. I enjoyed it. It paid for my college and everything, and I, I that enjoyed was, it. That was the same thing with me when I played yeah. basketball. I loved the sport, and I was pretty yeah. good at it at certain times. But I found it really to have much in common with the other guys on my team. Yeah, and you know, that was one thing that kind of hurt me. 
because mm-hmm. I was kind of an outcast in you know the social aspect of being on a on a sports team. Mm-hmm. I didn't really have a lot in common with them. I, you know, they I were understand. all eating up with sports and all that kind of stuff. You know, which I liked basketball, I liked playing, but I was into all kinds of other things. Yeah. You know, so well that's and I, I think that's healthy. You know, I guess here we are patting ourselves on the backs, but I, it's just kind of the way I look at the world. I'll never forget when I was at uh, when I was playing college basketball. We had uh, the great. Bill Russell came by and uh, and spoke. He's actually not speaking just to the basketball team. It was uh, it was a, it was a speech he gave about some different different issues, political issues and, and whatnot. And uh, Bill Russell, Hall of Famer, NBA player, if you don't know who he is, but uh, he made a comment at which I and I had you know, at that time I did I, I watched the NBA. I loved uh, I loved watching the game and I, I could name lots of the players. I was never eaten up with it, but I, I knew. Uh, fair amount. We, I grew up in the Cincinnati area, northern Kentucky, and we had actually an NBA team there, the Cincinnati Royals. You know, at the time, Oscar Robertson and all that. So I followed it. But and I, w- I was a Celtics fan, watched them play. So it was great to actually meet uh, uh, Bill Russell. Yeah, and, so you're, and it's one of your heroes. Yeah, he really up. was because yeah. he was a great rebounder, and I, I I fancied myself. I mean, I pattern. You know, I I uh, I. I struggled to be as good a rebounder as I could, even though I love to shoot too. But I, but anyway, uh, and I asked, I was able to talk to him, asking some questions about his secret for rebounding, all that kind of thing. And and uh, but anyway, in a speech, he made a comment because here he is, Bill Russell. It's like uh, if you don't know him, it's like Michael Jordan almost. Of he's the like, times. he's out there with like Dr. J. Yeah, you know. of the time, bigger actually than him. Probably. Yeah. But he said that uh, he said I'm I'm not a basketball player. He said, I'm not, I know you think I'm a basketball player, but I'm not really a basketball player. He said, I'm a man who plays basketball. Yeah. And that really struck me as, because uh, I had had those thoughts in my own head, and he put it in those words, and, it, and uh, I don't know, it just made me probably feel better at the time, because I never did feel like I really fit in, because so many people involved in anything, just like what we're talking about, they get eaten up with it. They're sucked into it, and it's the entire world. And I didn't really feel that way about it, even though I enjoyed it. I was someone who was involved in other things, and uh, I, quite frankly, enjoyed reading a good Shakespeare play more than basketball practice, you know, at the time. And so I don't know. It's, and he, he he elaborated on it; it just made a lot of sense. But but anyway, uh, how do we get off on all that? I don't know. He was, <laughs> he was a wise guy, though. He really he was. was. I mean, well, he still is. He's alive. That's right. <laughs> yeah. He yeah. I'm, I mean, I don't know that I would agree with all his politics. You know. Uh, but, but he clearly, it, like, yeah, had, but that's okay. had some sense. That's the thing. I always respect someone who seems to have really good uh, critical thinking abilities, even if I disagree with them. Mm-hmm. Like, for example, like Bill Maher, for example. I probably disagree with almost everything that he says politically, a lot of the things he says. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's obviously really anti-gun and all this kind of stuff. But I've always had a little respect for him because he does seem to try to think, you know, outside the box for the most part. Uh, which, speaking of that, which is one thing I always thought was really funny because, I mean, he is a – you know he's hard left um you know anti-gun mm-hmm. and which doesn't necessarily mean you have to be anti-gun but that's that's where he stands on everything basically and i remember watching his show one time and he made a comment about and they were talking about guns and how he didn't think people should have guns and all this kind of stuff but he said like he really said this he said but i'm gonna have one while these other crazy people out here have one <laughs> all these gun nuts while they've got guns i'm gonna have one and and when he said that i was like yes like <laughs> you you just you just made the argument that we've all been trying to make forever you know that's right that's amazing yeah i'm the same way i i mean obviously you, you want to gag sometimes when you hear somebody you know talk and pontificate in just the opposite direction you know that, that you think or i think but but then again that's a great thing about the country, and you know I always applaud uh, creative and original thinking. And if you disagree with 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 me, of course I'm always right. But you know if you disagree, yeah, I'm exactly. sorry for you. No, I I think it is good if they're thinking. Yeah, and, and it's good for you yeah. to hear other perspectives right. and things, right? Because you only know what you perceive. And maybe they'll eventually come around to my way of thinking, the right way of thinking. You know, right. if they're thinking. Eventually, right. I think that will happen <laughs> throughout history. And uh, well, and again, on what we were talking about, that that's the the thing. You see people that feel like they uh, they can't drive a Prius because they uh, they own a double barrel shotgun. Yeah. Or, or oh, because Jeff Dunham made fun of the Prius car. Oh, I won't be cool now. Or you know, that's another thing. It's like if if one of your uh, hero, if if the the center. 
piece hero of your cultural mm-hmm. trap that you're in or whatever it is yeah. <laughs> uh says something then you then automatically if you do that then it's like you're going against everything you believe in oh i know you know and that's not good i just hate people locked in i i, I remember uh I, I talked with somebody one time and uh and this person was I guess you'd say very, very far to the left, uh, a person I really like. I've had a lot of friends. I know some of you may be uh, surprised, but I've had a lot of friends who really, really are on the left, you would say, and some potentially, uh, you know, maybe kind of anti-gun. I don't know. I was never sure about some of them, but just some interesting people. And I talked with this gal for a while, and I remember one day she, she made this comment about, you know, it's, how, it's funny how people will reveal themselves to you in just the smallest comments, but... I uh, was late for, for work and running late or whatever and got behind this. And the way she said it, she said, I, oh, I got behind this. And she drove some small car, of course. Uh, but she said, I, I got behind this I got behind this lady in this big SUV. And the way she said SUV, it yeah. spoke volumes. And it, it, what it said was anyone who drives a large SUV cares nothing about the planet nothing about our resources cares nothing about the environment and uh but you know it's just everybody gets in their own little way of thinking the way their group and then they stay just like and we're all guilty of it yeah i'm a i'm a, a shooter i love firearms and uh i'm sure i'm blind blinders on for some things and i try not to but i, I just thoroughly enjoy uh, the hobby enjoy shooting enjoy being able to defend myself uh the second amendment gives us that right I uh, or it protects it, and, yeah. and I and I, you know, as, even though I try to think outside the box and keep an open mind, you know, I, I just think that's uh, I think that's the way to think. Yeah, and one thing that people we tend to do, and and uh, when I say people, I mean me too. I mean we all do it, uh, but it's important to be mindful of everything that we can. But um, we tend to like you know, when we're, as we're trying to understand everything that's going on in the world, we tend it's like a puzzle. And we pick up certain pieces along the way that may be true or maybe not, but we tend to fill in the rest of those puzzle pieces with whatever suits the the full picture that we want. That's something That's right. that, that we tend That's to right. do because yeah. no one ever has no one ever has you know the full picture. The picture yeah. But we make it. We want to though. We have to have the full picture. We just have to. Oh, we so, have to have the answer. Yeah. So we fill it in with as, with whatever fits the rest best, of it as best we can. Yeah. At the yeah. Time. Yeah. Hey. A good friend of mine once said, what was the line? Uh, man hears what he wants to hear and disregards the rest. Yeah. Oh, that's right. That was Paul Simon. He was out <laughs> at the range one day. I think he made that comment. That's right. I, no, I heard someone say, never, I can't remember who it was that said this, but it was great. He said, never trust anyone who has found truth. But if you meet someone who is searching for truth, or, or basically never trust anyone who has found truth, right. only someone who is searching for truth. There you go. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Something like that. There you go. Uh yeah, you know, I get a lot of messages from people who are really of the left persuasion that uh, that uh, again, not to pat ourselves on the back, but they 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 show appreciation to uh, to us for. Uh, I think they feel like they're accepted. Yeah, and, that, our, and that's channel. and that's intentional. It, it is, and we and we we value that. Yeah, really because do. we care about people on the left and the right because well, they're we all people. Care. Yeah. We're all, you know, we're all the same. We care about protecting our gun rights, but I mean, I even care about people who don't want to protect our gun rights. Yeah. And I care about trying to, you know, get the ideas out there so maybe they can, you know, see it a little bit differently. You know, but you know, I care about all people, and and whether you're on the left or you're on the right, it doesn't matter. We're just sharing ideas, you know. Yeah, and because we, and we hear from a lot of those folks, and I I tell them that look, you're welcome here. I'm glad you enjoy the videos. If you're a friend of the Second Amendment, you're a friend of mine. Yeah, you know, exactly. That's the way I kind of we look at it, and and I still say, from a, I guess a, I don't know if it's a selfish uh, perspective or not, but uh, but that uh, if a person feels open at all to possibly owning a gun, sometime maybe right now they're not, but they they uh, they see our videos or other videos or just that their uncle has a gun, whatever it is, whatever brings them to a firearm. I think if they make that that big step at some point and they become a firearms owner that that will i think change their perception in in some yeah. ways you know they will they will they will begin to see uh i know they they hear this this person i'm talking about whoever it is they might they might see some of us gun owners as making too big a deal about the overreaching government for example uh 
and too much government control, and they don't see it. They like it, you know. But I think if, if we can get guns in their hands, their owners, they go to the range, they enjoy shooting, and they see what fun this is and then and how good it feels to know you could protect yourself or your family if you needed to, uh, and then I think maybe they'll start seeing things a little differently. Yeah, bring re- personal responsibility for the dangers in the world back. You yeah. know, that's the thing. Like, people have kind of um, – we've lost – some of our individuality you know in the world and that's one thing that guns gives you is it it gives you personal responsibility for your own safety yes which is something that we have whether we have guns or not you know to to think that we don't have responsibility for our own safety is just is just a delusion basically because we do but we need guns to make ourselves you know more safe basically that's right well yeah it kind of comes down to what i said many i think it was a a couple hundred years ago, I coined the phrase that the, you know God might have made men, but the cult made them equal, or something like yeah. that. Yeah, I forgot how I said it first, but uh, oh right. wait a minute, that was Sam Cole. Wasn't it? Yeah, but uh, yeah, it's a great equalizer. I mean, whether you're you know a ninety-five pound uh, weakling or three hundred pounds, you know that that firearm is uh, definitely an equalizer. Yeah, you, you hope you don't ever have to use it. Of course, I think that's another thing that I can understand how people who don't like firearms and they're, they're way left and, and they see us as big bullies, big macho people that, uh, I don't know, looking for a chance to shoot somebody or something or kill Bambi. I mean, you know, there's all kinds of ways they can look at us because we're, and we enjoy a hobby. We enjoy the hobby yeah. so much. We enjoy firearms. Just like the reason we're sitting here even talking about it and we do videos, we just thoroughly enjoy it. Just like yeah. a car nut or a motorcycle nut or whatever. It's just so much fun. And we enjoy it so much. And we want to protect the right to, to do it. We enjoy the freedom and the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. And so we are talking about it a lot. We're making yeah. a big deal out of it because we, we find ourselves having to defend it a lot. So, yeah. you know. Anything that's under scrutiny. You yeah. find yourselves being you find yourself being really interested in talking about it and trying to mm-hmm. trying to spread uh, information yeah. about it, you know, because you know because that you know that's the thing with the um, with with guns. There's there's so much information out there that that at least it, you know if you don't like guns, there's some information you need to be made aware of before you really make a mm-hmm. decision. At least, right? You know, at you know at the very least. But yeah, it's a. Uh, it, I mean, there's ironically, uh, the the NRA, you know, has to spend so much time, you know, fighting this fight, and the other, uh, the Gun Owners of America, Second Amendment Foundation, all these organizations have to spend so much time involved in this lobbying, and we have to. Uh, that's where a lot of our membership dues go to, and the money we donate, you know. But you know, back in uh, the early days, I, I don't know when all this started, probably in the '60s, '70s. The uh, the NRA focused mainly on just training people to shoot, you know, police to shoot, civilians to shoot. It was a gun safety organization. It was a training, and still is. But you wait, know, they, are you telling me that the NRA is not founded by a white supremacist group? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go, there you go, and that's and, and that's sad that uh, that that's kind of the perception of people. People perceive things the way they want to see them again, and, yeah. and whatever course, whatever you know, whatever fits their little the rest of their little puzzle pieces. That's you know? right, and we're all guilty of that. I have so many. Oh yeah, I, I see comments on on our videos. Uh, people, I mean, it's kind of a backhanded compliment. I say they. They said, well, they're, they're, they act surprised, or they'll write me, and they're surprised because here I am, a, a, an old white guy. You know, I fit the stereotype yeah. of the old white guy uh, with his guns, you know, and, and so they're, they're so uh, people will actually, it's a compliment when they, they say, you don't really fit the stereotype, or you seem to enjoy guns, or you don't seem, uh, you know, as mean as, as some, I don't know. We all know some old guy that is just a, a, a curmudgeon and he's a hard to get along with maybe it's that gun shop owner it's we were everybody. talking about earlier you know yeah. close-minded and uh, maybe i'm close-minded too but i try not to be but uh it's sad that those comments even come it's age should not be a factor gender should not be a factor color should not be a factor that's what that's what's frustrating to a lot of us uh, gun owners and shooting enthusiasts i think is that that well, the NRA, you know, is kind of still associated as old white guys, and and they're trying to change that image now. I know, and I mean, firearms and the Second Amendment. It, it I, I'm still disappointed when I go to a gun show, a big gun show. 
that what 98 percent of the people in there are they're not old guys but all white guys you know yeah. or women or something you know, where are the minorities where, where everybody should be enjoying the shooting sports yeah when i was competing in, in all the various competitions i've done again you'd have just one or two people in there it seemed like of color and where is everybody get a gun and, and part of it i think goes back i don't know we didn't mean to get off on this but uh but um we didn't mean to get off on anything. Probably we're talking about, but yeah. uh, we didn't mean to start this. Just, <laughs> That's right. I didn't. That just showed up, and uh, all of a sudden, before we know, we're on the talking yeah. to microphones. But that was something that we didn't really talk about. We were talking about the gun shop owners and the and the the rude gun shop owners, gun dealers. I, not only do they turn off young people or people who are new into firearms, but they you know they just turn off all sorts of people. You yeah. know, people of uh, other ethnic groups that that. They they want to maybe maybe buy a gun you know yeah. they, they walk into a uh, you're some uh, uh, minority you know ethnic origin and you you go into this gun shop and there's there's two or three old white guys and they're sitting around they're not even friendly with each other yeah. they're not even friendly with another old white guy that walks yeah. in there and you walk in and, and you feel like okay these people yeah. hate me they're racist or whatever and they might be I don't know and even if they are friendly it's hard not to have preconceived notions yes you yeah. walk in with preconceived notions anyway you're looking for it you know and, and my gosh you'll find it yeah. and and on a positive note I guess it's a positive note if you are someone who is uh, I don't know whatever the minority might be uh, John's a minority, you know. Look how ugly he is. There's not yep. many people that ugly. No, yep. with his long hair, he's kind of a minority, and, and he sees this. Well, uh, uh, to some extent, but not a, I'm not. A, I, I can cut my hair. <laughs> I can fix hair that. <laughs> some things you can't fix. But in terms of, of of appearance, but I mean, don't don't feel like you're being singled out if you are a, a, of, a of of some minority group or whatever for whatever whatever reason whatever a minority. Don't feel like you are are being singled out. Because <laughs> all of us feel that way lots of times when yeah. we go into a gun shop. Because I still see it. You know, every gun shop I go into, they don't know me, believe it or not. You know, and everybody's and, a minority somewhere too. And, is the thing to remember. Yeah, and and I will I will have people just not very helpful, rather really rude. You know, they're actually rude. They don't. You wouldn't dare uh, venture into a trade or, or talk about much. You know, with them. I, I like John said. It's hard to understand because we're all firearms. It's like walking into a toy store in a lot of ways. It's like going to if you're a young kid going to Toys R Us, you're excited. You know, it's like a, I guess like a eight year old going into Toys R Us, and Christmas is coming, and you're all excited, and all the clerks are just rude to you or something. Yeah. You know, it just doesn't. Or doesn't if like fit. you're a musician walking into a music store. Usually, yeah. music stores are run by musicians yeah walking to guitar center i mean most of them are musicians yeah and it'd be like walking in there as it be if you're a musician walking in there to buy a guitar and they're like rude to you or something yeah like, come on you both play guitar <laughs> like you know like i don't get it and and part of it is uh again it's just people just their nature i guess or they yeah. they have a hard time dealing with uh people uh, people day. feel like they have to be in constant competition with each other we can't just mm -hmm. get along or or um, you know, work. We we can't work with each other. We have to work against each other in some way. And everyone knows those people that they're an extreme example of, uh, of that. We're talking about is those people that they always have to get over on you somehow, some way. Yeah, they always have to feel like they were better than you at something. You know, or that's whatever. True. And that's just that's just an old that's just leftover stuff from a long time ago. And I guess, and uh, and again, in their defense, we uh, we tend to remember the negative, don't we? On anything, mostly, because right. that's and, what we want to change. So that's what we talk know. about. Yeah, you know? yeah. It's like, yeah, I, it's like it's so it's so funny. People say, "Well, all the news is negative." Yeah, that's it's it's negative because generally things go well for people. <laughs> the yeah. world world the world works for the most part. So yeah, news would be negative by definition. Yeah, that's and, the, and that's the problem with the news is because mm -hmm. you get the wrong idea about things because the whole reason. The whole point of the news is to show you the things that are wrong, usually, or, or whatever. Or what's think, happening? Yeah, or whatever. Whatever is um, unusual. Unusual, basically. Yeah, better. That's better. So if you watch the news and you're watching only things that are unusual, then it gives you the, a different idea about reality. Yeah, if you're not careful, yeah, you tend to think that's the way things are. Yeah, you know? but. I don't know that. Uh, it, yeah, again, we. I've been in uh, most gun shops are, are not like that. Probably, I, I guess that might be a stretch to say most. Uh, it's getting better. I think. Sometimes I, I think, it's, I think it's half and half. But yeah, I think it is a little better. The competition's out there. There's a lot of gun shops. A lot of gun shops have gone out of new business. New shooters. So many new shooters now. Yeah, 
and, so, and everybody's fighting for that. So yeah. Well, on a, you know, on a lighter topic, one thing I thought would be interesting to talk about is just the, um, you know, the, like what you know what's changed between now and the past. You know, whatever seven eight years ago, before um, Hickok Forty Five was anything more than just a a screen name for you to post comments on blogs. You know. Yeah. And it's it's kind of interesting because it's like, you know, we do, we don't really. I mean, obviously, like we there's a lot of we do a lot of work on our you know our project, keeping it going and doing all that kind of thing. But it's but at its uh, at its core, it's like the same stuff we've been doing since I was a kid, really. You know. Yeah, that's true. That's true. It it has changed, but and and some people might uh, might think that. Well, but shooting's not as much fun for you now, or that you know, because uh, you know this thing is it's gotten bigger than we thought it would, and there's always stuff to do, and guns coming and going, and everything in the mail. But but really, uh, it's still shooting, and I, I never really have that feel. Oh, maybe once in a great while, that feeling that oh man, like oh I miss the old days. We just go out and shoot yeah. and not think about the next video or, or sighting in this gun for the next video or, but yeah, really, I, it's fun. Know, yeah. It's just fun. That's yeah, like, the fun. The fun has just sort of changed. I yeah. mean, it's, it's, it's taken on a different identity. You all. never get like really the biggest problem people face is, is boredom where they realize that that's what it is or not. There's, yeah. there's constantly a new challenge for us. Yes. There's a new gun for us to do and try to bring to people in the most fair way we possibly can. And there's always something new for us to do a new accomplishment uh, for us to try to, achieve and uh it's you know it's really been exciting and a lot of and a lot of fun i mean it was more laid back before we just you know because you were teaching and stuff mm-hmm. and we're hanging out and shooting guns but in a way it is kind of a more uh blown up version of what we've always been doing which really kind of makes it neat you know on yeah, a personal level at least. that's right yeah it, it does it's just like yesterday i went out with a, a rifle we'll be doing a video on i was just trying to sight it in and mess around with it some and and, you know, if 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 it, we flashed back eight years or something, I would have gone out. I'd have just gone to the safe, and it was a nice weather on Sunday afternoon. I would have picked up something, Colt forty five or nineteen eleven or Glock or rifle of some sort, and I'd have gone out and taken a few shots. But that was just as much fun, really, taking that different rifle out and and making sure the sights are on and. You know, getting a feel for it because we'll be doing a video at some point, and we'd already shot it, but the sights were not on really well. Yeah. To put some sights on, that's the thing about getting these guns in. Sometimes they don't have any sights on them. You know, a lot of the ARs, so we have to put on some uh, backup iron sights or a red dot or something, and then sight them in, shoot them, and see how they work. So, yeah, that's that's all interesting, and and, and I think all of us can relate to getting stagnant uh, with the the shoot, even the shooting sport that you really, really like. If you have been involved in it for a uh, several years and you do buy a new gun occasionally, but maybe your budget doesn't allow you to buy a lot of guns, you just, every now and then you pick up one, uh, you know, maybe you don't shoot for a few months because, you know, you just been looking towards this new gun or something or whatever it might be. So you just don't shoot for a while or none of your buddies seem to be interested in it or whatever it is. Well, that that never happens now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's for sure. There's yeah. always something new and interesting. Although I sort of made I sort of uh, made shooting new and interesting, I guess, even before that because I was always getting into some new competition, whether it was cowboy shooting and then when I was in that, I switched into shooting just black powder. Or you weren't closed minded off of the different types yeah. of guns and things. Yeah, some people can get, which is fine. I mean, actually, I mean, if you, there's some type of some certain little part of, of shooting that you just absolutely love, and that's all you do only. Nothing wrong with that. No, uh, but and those people aren't. It's not that they're closed minded necessarily. It's just that they that's all they care about. But it's also mm-hmm. kind of neat. Um, especially you know when I was a kid, I, it was neat that you were into lots of different things. So I got to have fun shooting the old, you know, uh, muzzle loaders and Glocks and ARs and all the different things. You know, it's kind of neat. Yeah, yeah, I've always uh, liked that. I guess just being interested in. Uh, well, I don't know why exactly. I guess part of the culture, you know, being uh, watch loving World War Two movies. Yeah. And, westerns and just everything and then, yeah. and then once you shoot anything you can't help it if it shoots well and it feels good you can't help but like it and then you develop a little interest in the history and i as i have admonished people in, in my radio show you know, you know 
diversify a little bit, you know, you'll enjoy it. I think, you know, yeah, because there's, you know, we that's of course expensive. <laughs> We're all trying to diversify too yeah. much, right? Even if it's just a little bit, though, even just yeah. a little bit can make a difference. If all you have is ARs and you yeah. know polymer handguns, just even having one, you know, old nineteen eleven or a Colt single action oh. or something like that can make a huge difference. Exactly. I, yeah, I would advise somebody. I mean, I, I or a, a Mosin. Talk. That's a great thing oh, about yeah. the Mosins. Yeah. Is that someone who doesn't have much of a budget for guns? They've got the things that they really need. That's right. You know, I think they're up to like 150 now or something, aren't they? But still, yeah. pretty cheap. Yeah. Get you a Mosin. There you go, right there. Diversify. You know? Yeah, yeah. And there are a lot of inexpensive firearms out there now. Of course, we review some of them and uh, can't review everything, but there's just a lot of them out there. You know, say what you will about guns from Turkey or whatever country or Argentina, the Philippines. There, there. I think those those firearms, while they might not be the very best. A lot of them are pretty well made, and they hold yeah. up really well so that a person can say your goal at some point is to have a 1911, but you just can't see yourself paying 1000 or $1,500 for one. Well, you know, for about 400 you could yeah. actually have a 1911 that works. And then maybe even the, cheaper was it that T yeah. sauce was like three fifty or something? Yeah, it? and I saw some of these uh, Black Friday sales on some of these things. You know, just really unbelievable prices on some of this. So you can actually diversify a little bit. Oh, what I was going to say is, you know, if you have, I mean, you know, what man, that's the neat thing about shooting and and firearms, whatever you want, you know, enjoy it and go with it. But I would advise before you buy that tenth Glock, you know, yeah. that tenth M and P. Uh, Smith and Wesson, yeah, maybe maybe forego one of those and get you a 1911, even if it's a yeah. cheap one, or or get you a muzzle loader, you know, and just you know diversify a little bit. It doesn't does cost a fortune, especially if you've got all these other guns. You've yeah. got 39 guns of the same kind, you know, and there are people like that, and again, we shouldn't criticize that, right? I know you'll run across someone who's a Mauser collector, yeah. you know, almost all they have are Mausers. You know, or just Rugers. They've got every model of Ruger, and that's kind of their thing. And that's the beauty of any any hobby: collecting stamps, coins. You know, whatever. All, yeah. A lot of times, there's you know, with anything, there's going to be one certain area that you kind of focus on. Yeah. You know, is what's going to happen. Of course, I don't really uh, when it comes to guns. I don't. I'm not. There's really. I can't even think of a certain type of gun that I would even want to focus on really I yeah. want to have a nice wide selection of yeah. lots of things which is kind of what I have now I'll just well you know one, one of the reasons I think is because you're a shooter yeah you know, we're shooters I think some people uh you, you could you could separate uh I guess firearms enthusiasts into a couple of groups like what's the old line uh there's two kinds of people in the world those who divide everything into two groups and those who don't yeah yeah you know, I made that one up too <laughs> uh no um but if you're not a shooter much, you don't really get through the range hardly, you know, at all or something. Like, then if you're a collector, I can kind of see a difference there. Like where we love to shoot and experiment with different guns, and that's one of the things about firearms. I always, I never feel quite as guilty about being, uh, I guess, materialistic or whatever as if you were collecting. I don't know what what would it be? Something uh, maybe stamps even, and not to pick on stamp collectors, but you collect something that you just put in a drawer and look at. You know, yeah. or something. You know, uh, firearms are like tools. They really are. Yeah. And, uh, maybe not necessary once you get past two or three of them. But you, you, I envision myself shooting these things, loading for them, and, and shooting them. What targets I'm going to shoot with them? That yeah. that's the value of a firearm. That's why I don't have any firearms that I don't shoot. Yeah. And I and I don't think that's yeah. the materialism in the negative way. Because to me, the negative uh, form of materialism it's more about the intention, not the actual action. Yeah, yeah, you know, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's, the, be, it's the it's the uh, it's the motive behind it. Not be over analytic. If, if you're if your point in life is chasing material objects, then you're missing out on something. But yeah. but if in chasing that thing that uh, you've decided is your purpose, and you decide to to take use the spoils of that to buy material objects, there's nothing, you know, nothing wrong yeah. with that for sure. Yeah, that makes no sense, John. No, <laughs> that makes good sense. Uh, the uh, yeah, it's like it's kind of like collecting bicycles or something, or mountain bikes that you ride. You know, that's the way I kind of look at it. Is it's it's a it's it's an it's an adventure almost. You know, what's it going to be like shooting this firearm? I can't wait to get this firearm and shoot it, and yeah. and see how well I can shoot it or not shoot it, and you know, all that kind of thing. They're they're objects you do something with. I guess is what I'm just trying to get at. Yeah, not exactly. to, not to get too deep, but they're just they're objects that you do something with and you can have fun with. And they have real purposes, like they can yeah. save your life. 
Yeah. Not yeah. and some of them you wouldn't use for that necessarily because they're I don't know, outdated in those terms. But okay. still, it's still like a tool you can go yeah. and have fun with it and all that. Yeah. And they have historical significance. Yeah. And there's so many elements of, of it that's just uh They're like they're yeah. almost like uh anchors in time. Yeah. You know. Like that's what's neat. Like I've always been someone who kinda like I like collecting things, you know, especially like some old things and stuff mm-hmm. like that because you know, time is a really slippery kind of thing. Yes. And when you own something that represents a time um, in our history and culture, it's like it's like you uh, you got like a anchor point on that time to an extent. You know, what I mean, you have like a reference point. You can hold that hold that gun from that Garand that you have from World War Two. You know, you can hold that and really feel that time and what took place. You know, and all that kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah, really. So sure. yeah, that's what makes it so special and uh makes it much more enjoyable i i, I mean i like uh, a modern firearm and but boy when you pick up an old mauser or, you know, world war ii american rifle it's yeah. just, oh, boy. or even muzzle loaders muzzle loaders it doesn't have to be like an original one that was there just a you pick up a a real muzzle loader not like those hunting one those whatever right. those synthetic stock ones but like yeah. a real muzzle loader like the brown vest you have or the right. or the infields and stuff you hold that and you think like this was a gun at one time <laughs> yeah you know? this was the gun yeah. yeah this was like the ar you know mm-hmm. this is what people uh wanted this is what people were trusting their lives with and that's right and uh it really puts it in perspective and that's the other cool thing about the diversification i guess we're off top well in a way we're not because we're talking about the how things have changed with the hickok 45 thing channel and everything what one of the cool things about uh is shooting so many different firearms or experimenting or having the experience with a lot of different firearms is you know what it's like. We know what it's like. And a lot of you listeners, you know what it's like to shoot a Mauser. You know what it's like to fire a Garand, the feel of it, yeah. how it, that ping when the clip ejects, you know that when you're watching saving private Ryan, that's not some foreign, uh, I wonder what that's like. Yeah. You know exactly what it feels like yeah. to shoot that Garan or that muzzle loader. And the weight of it, how heavy it was, yeah. and manipulating it. What it would be like carrying it around. And like with any firearm, whether it's a Glock, you're watching any cop show these days, and most of the time they're packing a Glock. You're watching a New York cop show. Uh, you know, you've never even held a Glock 19. Well, you know, I, mean, I forget that sometimes. That we that, that any any of us shooters, not just John and, and, and I, but we 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 don't have, we don't even wonder what that's like. Yeah, I mean, you know we've we've shot well. Ironically, we know more about what it's like than the actors do. There's are fake yeah. guns half the time, yeah. and they're shooting blanks. So yeah, they, exactly. They really don't know. We know what it feels like to feel a 45 slug, you know, leave the barrel of a 1911 or a 45 70, and 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 then. Uh, the, the, of speaking of the differences, the Hickok 45 thing, and because of all the various firearms that have come through the shooting table, we have both John and I both we have a uh, we have more of that experience. We know what it feels like to shoot a yeah. Scar 17, and oh man, we could it would take a long time to think of all the firearms that we oh uh, done man, with. <laughs> I know I've never... actually fired them. You know the Luger, just you name it. You know, yeah, that that's been one of the neatest things about this whole this whole thing that we've done is getting to uh experience so many different firearms yeah. you know i mean we, oh, we've it had is. it's just crazy how many we've had in our hands and then it further helps us talk about new firearms we've shot so many it does you know? and compare and uh, that's a unique I, yeah, opportunity yeah i think that's one of the things that uh that 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 hopefully people uh, come to the channel for is uh and i, and I, I say that because you know we don't do the the detailed reviews that some people do i've seen some people take a gun out of the box on their on their bed the the bedroom reviews as we call them you know and maybe actually give more information sometimes than i do about that pistol yeah and i I don't really feel bad about that i should i should probably cry in my beer but i don't (laughs) i don't really feel bad about that because it's we try to do some of that and try to give you the essential information but don't always remember everything and uh I think because of the experience that we have with all these different firearms, I think one of the one of the things that that we can offer is just the, our impressions of the firearm. You know, yeah. it's compared with so many others, and and then whether it's something that works, and whether it shoots well, whether it seems to shoot well, and, uh, the operation of it, the field stripping maybe, and 
you know, just just my impressions, John's impressions of of the firearm, and I try to get, I try to when John does uh, videos on some of the video uh, the the guns, of course, but uh, I try to remember uh, sometimes to to throw in what he thinks of it, and if John thinks totally different, if you think totally different of the firearm, you know, or you don't like the trigger, I do like trigger. What I try to mention that as much yeah. as I can because usually that's we valuable too, because John sh- has shot he. You know, he still seems young to me because he's just still a dumb little kid, right? <laughs> so he seems very young. But uh, but when you think about it objectively, he's had a, a vast amount of experience with a vast number of firearms. Been and, shooting uh, for uh, twenty three years. Now. Yeah, <laughs> as you can see, he uh, he uh, you know he shoots a lot and shoots really well. And also, you know, I mean, again, we're not. There's a lot of people that shoot us, but but we do shoot a lot. Oh, that reminds me. Before I forget it, the, I was telling you the, about that comment. I was looking through the uh, videos. This is the beauty of having your own radio shows. You can just do whatever you want, skip ge- uh, gears and everything. That's right. But I was telling uh, you the other morning, uh, it was just a couple of days ago, I saw a comment on one of the videos, and uh, some of the comments come to me in email. And uh, and it was um, the comment was, speaking of John being young, it was um, the only, and it's still up there, I guess, the only, the only person – in the Vanderbilt nursery, the only gun owner, no, it was the only gun owner in the Vanderbilt nursery. And that was the only comment. Oh, yeah. That's a, and that's that, I think that's exactly what it said, the only gun owner in Vanderbilt nursery. Yeah. And uh, so I thought, you know, it's like if there's some troll, horrible troll comment, I'll go to the video and I'll look at it. And if it's not been filtered out already, you know, because profanity or whatever, I'll uh, I'll uh, answer them or delete them or block, you know, the troll if they need it or whatever. But so I thought, okay. The only gun owner in the Vanderbilt. Okay, so this guy, this guy must be a, a gun owner, and he works at the Vanderbilt Nursery. Well, that's good. He's willing to admit that, you know. And he works at Vanderbilt, a university medical center. So I was, so I went to the video. I was going to thank him for admitting that because he's, uh, you know, working in a, an environment. You know, sometimes where guns are frowned upon, and I was going to just say, you know, congratulations for admitting you're a gun owner. Well, I, I didn't know what it was. So anyway, I got there, and I realized, oh, there's the video on the what was it the seventh. I don't know, your pump shot uh, rifle I got you when you were born. What's the yeah. model? 640? It's like five. I always uh, forget the model number on that Remington. <laughs> seven, remember. seven. It has a seven in it. I want to say 742 or something like that. I want to say 572 for some reason, but that's I think not that right. Might, that it? might be it. It's that pump Remington yeah. uh, 22 but that I got him the day he was born. And in that video, I told that story about how I, I went out that day he was born, uh, that morning, and I bought it, bought him that in the book. And so that's what the guy was talking about. He was he was talking about John being the only gun owner in the nursery, and I just thought that was so funny. Yeah. I don't remember whether I answered him or not. <laughs> that was hilarious. And that was a really scary couple of hours <laughs> where I realized I I'm now in the world and I don't even own a gun yet. That's right, because you were two three hours without a firearm. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, that was scary. But then it was also scary because it, it probably wasn't legal for you to be a gun owner in the Vanderbilt nursery. Yeah, even though you didn't have it there with you. That's true. At that time there were no carry permits and uh so I, I don't know that it was even legal for a baby to own one, particularly yeah. while you're still in the nursery. You should have gotten me a North American arms Derringer. I'd have been a little more my size, I think. <laughs> I could have sneaked it in there. <laughs> oh man, but that was funny. I never thought of John being a gun owner when he was lying there. <laughs> <laughs> that is funny. Oh, boy. That, that's one of the, another one of the neat things that's it's um, really just flavored our lives, you know, mm-hmm. since we, uh, before we did this, it was just all the feedback, yeah. you know, and, and like the sense of community with all of our fans and all this kind of stuff. And, and uh, our fans teach us things, you know, we try to put information out for our fans. And it's like this big cycle, you know, where we're giving and getting, That's you know, right. like, I think it was, uh, there's some line in a Neil Young song where he said, it's not, I can't remember what it was, but he said something like we, we gave away so we could keep what we had where we could keep what we gave yeah you know because it's kind of true if you want to keep something give it away yeah you know yeah. and that's uh that's that's so true it's that karma you know i mean you, you give it out and it comes back to you yeah whether it's positive or negative yeah speaking of those rude gun shop owners that's right yeah <laughs> they, they get the, but yeah we oh yeah you're right uh oh man and and i pick up so many little tidbits from uh from viewers and comments and people that write write me that i and I don't have time to read, uh, you know, to absorb everything because it's about maybe some gun model I've never heard of. So whatever they say about it doesn't necessarily stick. Yeah. But but lots of things do, and then uh, they have some good advice. And, and of course, 
the you know the the flatter is flattering uh, is embarrassing you know almost to an extent because uh, I mean yeah people are just so kind you know yeah they're, uh, they're really they really uh, so many people really do enjoy the videos I finally concluded they really do okay a lot of people do and so that's why we keep doing them so we don't change it we're trying yeah, not to. So, yeah we're, we're not gonna we don't know what it is that they like but uh i guess we'll just keep doing that whatever that is i guess we're not going to mess it up i was just telling somebody who wrote a comment i forgot what it was and what they were saying and why i even wrote that but i i was answering I was just this morning i think that uh that you know, we really didn't have a, a marketing plan. You know, they were oh I know they were they were being very flattering and about the, what they liked about the videos and our approach and everything. And and uh, I said, well, thank you, but it, there was really no marketing plan. Yeah. This wasn't any kind of plan. We're just glad you like that, but we just that's just that's just the way we would have done it no matter what. And it's the way we keep doing it because it's the way we've always shot. Well, like you were saying before Hickok forty five. After Hickok, or well, not after. I hope we're still doing it. <laughs> yeah, but uh, no, we're quitting today. Yeah, it's not really pre and post yet. Anyway, yeah. Uh, but yeah, we we just kind of do the same stuff for the most part. But I yeah. think back uh, the corny stuff that we've done and things we've shot. I relate. I think I shared in a recent radio show about how my my cousin and I back when we were uh, probably too young to be carrying a gun around the farm. You know. Would, would uh, try to shoot down some trees and just do things, but what, see what a firearm would do and all that kind of thing. And and uh, and then just shooting and enjoying shooting. It's just always it's just always something that uh, that we've done. I've done. And and uh, right there on that hillside, you know, for the most part, since uh, since we've been there. Of course, John, you grew up there, uh, but uh, it doesn't seem like it's been all that long since I bought that place. And and uh, walk the boundaries and make sure it was a good place to have a, a shooting range. And, uh, so. Yeah, one thing I'll tell you. One benefit too is um, is uh, I know definitely both of us have. Um, you know, we've always been people who are pretty comfortable with who we are, but we're not afraid of uh, being judged by the rest of society and all this kind of thing. But we definitely have thicker skin <laughs> for anyone <laughs> yeah. who puts themselves out there. That's right uh, on the internet definitely develop some really thick skin which of course makes it hard to get flu shots but it really <laughs> but it really it's just unavoidable either you're just gonna you know get discouraged or you're gonna develop thick skin and it, it, it's almost like a, a really healthy thing yeah. in some ways you know I, I looked at it beforehand like a um uh like it was annoying you know mm-hmm. and even though i wasn't like uh, in the videos as much in the early days you know, I would see comments. I would, you know, I'd still read a lot of the comments and all the videos and stuff. And I'd see someone talking bad about something that was maybe something that, like, maybe I thought of or whatever, and something that I liked. And it would be kind of offensive, you know, at first. You know, so then mm-hmm. once I got used to it, then it kind of just, <laughs> uh, just kind of roll off, you know. Right. And then later, you know, recently, especially since I've started this, um, you know, we well, we started the secondary channel. And I started posting videos and stuff on that uh, of just me. Then I started to see it as really it's a benefit, you know. Mm-hmm. It's really like a it's a good thing. It actually is. A, it's a really a good thing for just self growth that a lot of people don't get to take advantage mm-hmm. of. You know? Yeah, yeah. You have to take the good with the bad, and uh, and and some of the the critical comments are are uh, uh, they're useful. Yeah, they are. Yeah. yeah everybody's not a, a troll. You know, a lot a lot are. I mean, of the trolls, but uh, there there's some 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 good uh, criticism. Most of the best criticism that I've gotten in terms of constructive criticism is in private messages. You know, they'll, they'll actually write, take the time and write write you a message and say, I don't know if you knew this, but it would help if you would do this or that kind of thing. And uh, that way you know they're not grandstanding. Right. Because you know, that's, that's the thing a, yeah. That's the thing that's always hard to assess because when you have a large, large audience and you've got somebody, you know, at their keyboard and they wish they – uh, could could make a shooting video or that whatever and the, you know you don't know what what they're trying to do yeah, but they send you a, a private message you know that that it isn't yeah like I said, it's, it's not, not grand, about, that eliminates yeah. that it's not grand it's more genuine though. yeah it's, yeah it's more genuine you know they're not which I would do I, I mean that'd be my first thought yeah. if I had some advice for another youtuber or somebody I would write them a message which I yeah. which I do very rarely that, that's what's funny I think we've talked about that all of us a lot of us YouTuber how how it's interesting that everybody becomes a critic too. Yeah. And uh, you know, when I'm watching other videos or of, of, of whatever it might be, I might not like it or yeah, that guy's an idiot or or whatever it might be. But my first inclination is not to to write it in a comment 
wow, that's a really dumb thing you just did there. And if you did that, uh, or, or what? <laughs> it's yeah. just never crossed my mind. Yeah, I have, I, I just might not go watch any of their stuff again. Uh, or if I have something, I've only done this like twice, I think, in my life. But something that I saw in a video that maybe was really incorrect or whatever. Well, imagine that. There must be something wrong with me because I didn't just seize that moment to, yeah. to type some long comment and tell that guy what an idiot he was. <laughs> I don't know yeah. why. It must be something wrong with me. But I wrote, I wrote a private message to the person, and, and I was really hesitant to do that. Uh, but I just did it, and I just said, look, I, you know, good video, or like you're, you're pretty funny, or I like what you're doing. I said, you are probably going to catch it for yeah. something you said here. You might want to annotate it to head some of that off or something. Just trying to, yeah. trying to help them out. Yeah. And <laughs> I, I would heard, appreciate somebody doing that with me, and uh, people have done that. You know, if I uh, said something dead wrong, and you know, to remind yeah. me I need to annotate something, I've misspelled the title of the video or something. Yeah. Yeah, and I, and I admittedly, like, I, uh, I kind of understand the mindset – um, you know, of the troll, where that comes from. Yeah. Because whenever I was still in college and I first kind of was getting on YouTube and stuff like that, I get why they do the things that I do. I realized it pretty early on. Like I make it, like I would see something in a video that I knew was wrong. And this was like before we started doing the videos and I would make a comment and say, oh, you know, this, this or that. And then there'd be like a little bit of a thrill when someone like replied to it. Yeah, <laughs> you know, you get like a little bit of a thrill, like oh, I wonder if someone's gonna reply, and then someone says something mean, that's like oh, you can you reply back, you <laughs> yeah. know, and it becomes like so it's like yeah. it gives you like endorphins, you know, to do, <laughs> to do that. So I get why. So the trolls basically they're like they're thrill seekers, yeah, you know, and they're trying to get as much feedback as they possibly can. So they're kind of like they're kind of like the, well, you didn't play the the Mario games, but in the Mario games, there's this ghost, right? He's one of the enemies in the Mario games. Mm-hmm. And he, if you're looking at him, he comes after you. Oh no! If you're, yeah, if you're looking at him, he stays still. And if you're, uh, uh, anyway, never mind. Basically, Sorry, that, that was a bad it. example. But, yeah, uh, but basically, <laughs> if you ignore them, they go away. That's what, oh, I, okay. that's what I'm trying to say. Okay. <laughs> ignore them, they go away. And that was a bad example, but but they uh, but uh, they're kind of like you know the the bullies. You know, they yeah. just they just want a reaction. Yeah, all. yeah, that's right. They, they go away. Unfortunately, there's always one to replace the one that goes away. But. Yeah, it's whack-a-mole for sure. <laughs> yeah, we try to try not to acknowledge yeah, them. But I don't let them bother me. They're a no. dime a dozen. That's the thing, you know. Well, that's the thing. People, uh, I, I, well, this the internet still is relatively new. And it then is. also being able to to comment like you can. Like, you think about it. it when I, as I grew up, and, and even today, you're watching a TV show that you like, whether it's, uh, you know, Justified, you're sitting there watching an old episode of Gunsmoke or whatever you're watching a new show with sitcom or something and you think that something is stupid well, how do you make that known you can't just type under the screen you know, you're stupid you mean you when know, you were growing Matt, up yeah. watching the lone ranger back <laughs> yeah, in the 50s you didn't like call in and say fake yeah fake that rock you just leaned, that that gigantic boulder you just leaned against tonto moved yeah. fake it's call made it out of fake. paper you couldn't do it. You couldn't type it on the screen and call them out. You know? Yeah. So, so it's kind of a new thing to be able to do that. Yeah. And and also, you know, newspaper. We there's and I used to remind and tell them I would remind students how there is this thing with whenever something is typed. Uh, I think that has not gone away. There, there's something magical. Of course, what I would make the point to them was the verses handwritten. But if something's typed and published. And it's pretty on the page. It's centered, and it, it it's it's there. It's got the margin. It's there's something about it that takes on a life of its own. It it, it gets more credibility than really it ought to, just because yeah. it's published. And same with a book. I mean, anything in a book, any book. Uh, and of course, that leads people to to believe all sorts of things because it's published in a book. This pretty book with a pretty binder. Someone published it. Someone wrote this. Someone typed it out. They spelled the words correctly. They used yep. good grammar. There must be some validity to this. Well, yeah, maybe it's accepted on some level yes. because it's because it yeah. exists. And I used to one of my admonitions to students was with whenever we would study nonfiction, I'd give them that speech every year about how uh, well new students every year, <laughs> but how nonfiction uh, it's called nonfiction. But because it's supposed to be nonfiction, but then again, it was written yeah. by somebody, and uh, yeah, according to somebody, it's nonfiction. And is every single word in there nonfiction? Yeah. True, we don't know that. But anyway, there's something about uh, the fact that you can that you read these words typed, uh, and 
well, okay, that person, uh, whatever they said, I wonder if there's any validity to that. Yeah, they said that's mean. not a semi-automatic. That's not automatic, or that gun doesn't shoot that kind of group. Or the first whatever. reaction is to trust it, and then you yeah. have to go, okay, wait a minute, wait you a minute, know? it might not be true because their comment is right there on equal footing. It looks just like everybody else's comment. Yeah. For example, I could say something about in a video, or you could, about the best way to, to hold uh, a pistol to shoot it, the yeah. best way to grip it or something. Well, there could be five comments about that, uh, some of them disagreeing, some agreeing, whatever. And they've got these weird usernames, you know, <laughs> Harry, S47, or yeah. whatever they might be. Well, there they are all typed. Maybe the spelling's all correct, and... Okay, and maybe they're even written reasonably uh, with good grammar, whatever. And but they totally disagree. I, you know, we, we tend to give them kind of equal weight. We evaluate what the person said and everything. But when you think about it, I like to think about it and explain it this way. Well, two of those comments, we give them all equal weight. Could have been written by one of them. Could have been written by Clint Smith. Yeah. Who, if you don't know who Clint Smith is, he's a world famous trainer. One could have been written if you were still alive by Jeff Cooper. Or Masa Yub, he's still alive. One of those comments could have been written by Masa Yub. He might have a different username on YouTube or something. And one by Clint Smith, who might have some other username. You know, he might be uh, 45 Smith or something yeah. on, on YouTube. And then, uh, so you read those two comments, and then a the third comment, which carries equal weight to you. Guy says that uh, this grip actually is not the best uh, way to handle a Glock. You can shoot it better if you put your thumb over your finger or something like that. You read that one. Okay. Maybe that one is the answer. You know, this other guy who's actually Clint Smith maybe doesn't know what he's talking about. But the one you're reading there, you're wondering if it has validity or not, is is some, and again, I'm not picking on young people, but it's some 14-year-old sitting in his mom's basement who has read some gun magazines. Yeah. You know, but they tend to all get equal value. Yeah. Well, it'd be so, awesome if you had a basement to yourself. <laughs> yeah, I know. I shouldn't pick. Actually, yeah. I've spent my uh, 20 years picking on 14 year olds right. <laughs> when I was teaching. You know, but, but, you, know, you know what I mean. Yeah. You know. well, one thing you said about nonfiction, which I, I think is funny. Think about the term like nonfiction. You know, it kind of assumes yeah. a lot. It's kind of <laughs> yeah, like really. It's kind of like when someone says they're a realist. That's something yeah. that always cracked me up. Wait a minute, you're a realist, yeah. so that means you really? know, so you know what's real, yeah, and you're just right. the one who is capable of accepting it. That's you know? right. Come really? on. <laughs> oh, I forgot. I'm supposed to be laughing like Derek does. Right? Oh yeah, that's I, right. I, I, yeah. I, sorry, Derek. I was going to have a picture, so I'm laughing. No, I haven't laughed. I, had a, I remember I had a. Uh, a uh, philosophy teacher one time that said he was a realist and I didn't even think about it at the time. I was like, Oh, okay. Some people are realists and some people aren't. And as I got older, I was like, wait a minute, realist. Come on. I'm an unrealist. That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. And that was in a philosophy class. They wish I had a discussion about how ridiculous the term realist is, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. Oh, it kills me. Well, you're a little bit like me. Uh, we, we, uh, I, I've always enjoyed philosophy and even psychology. I've, uh, when I was in college, I took some electives in uh, psychology. I didn't have to take. I just, uh, well, hey, well, that's what an elective is, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and I've, I've just always enjoyed. It. I've read a lot of the philosophers. Uh, you know, just trying to get smarter. When you're as dumb as I am, you just do whatever you can. But I, it's always been interesting to me uh, the, the mind and yeah. how people think, what they think, and uh, why they think it. And uh, it's Good. it's interesting to read whether it's Plato or Ernest Becker, yeah. Robert Persick. You know, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. I've shared with y'all some of my favorite books before. Just exploring all that and uh, thinking about things. Because uh, so many, so many things, you know, that seem th that seem different from how they really are, and we don't take enough time to actually sit down and try to think. Well, maybe you know these are just symptoms, and this is not really the problem, and all these kinds of things. It's really philosophy. Mm -hmm. It's like you know, just trying to uh, to understand what's going on and maybe how to fix some of the problems that we face and all these kind of things. I almost wish more people would, you know, would talk about that kind of thing. Uh, more yeah you know because yeah. a lot of times people you know they they have conversations about just really uh, you know everyone has mundane conversations you know it's, right. you just do sometimes you want to talk about the football game or your cat or whatever you you want to but right but some people they never talk about you know serious things yeah they never get deeper yeah exactly they yeah. never they never talk about like mm -hmm. what we're doing here and all this kind of stuff so yeah exactly i and and I think part of it is because it's just we move move around uh, from day to day. 
course, we're talking about it now, and that's one of the beauties of doing these radio shows and our talk. We can, you know, we get away from the shooting range and sneak to talk yeah. about different things. And if we bore you, I'm sorry, but uh, it it is it is neat. I, I was just thinking driving. I don't know, in here last night or this morning, but uh, you know, as you move through society, there are a lot of superficial people. You know, yeah. people are. And of course, when you're young, you have a kind of a license to be superficial and shallow. As you get older, you start thinking a little more deeply about. Because it'd be nice if that would change, you know. Yeah, but. It would, and one of the things I probably uh, worked on it a little too hard when I was teaching, but I, uh, I uh, with youngsters, you know, 13 years old, I, you know, I really enjoyed you know, some of the literature we read and in, in the, which was philosophy, you know, in a lot of ways, uh, any good literature and, you know. It, Taxing their minds a little bit, getting them to think, not not uh, trying to indoctrinate them in any certain way of thinking, but just thinking about things. That's the neat thing about about literature. But uh, that was and one, of, and one of the books we read was The Giver, for example. And I was I always oh, I, I saw I, the movie. The, oh, yeah. did you? I yeah, know you'd gone to that yet, but well, the, book is, the movie's okay. I saw it, uh, but uh, the book is great, and it's an easy book to read. But you know any of these books about utopian, uh, or I find interesting because that's what so many of or the dysto- controllers they're calling dystopian. Yeah, 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 trying to create. But when you read that book, you uh, in a lot of ways you see today's society, and you see the way people are becoming because they are so uh, they're like robots. You know, a lot of people are like robot. They don't ever think beyond what's going on in front of them, it seems. Now, yeah. A lot of people do, you just don't see it because you're not good friends with them, you're not around them very much, but so much of society, they, they I'm reminded every year we read that, that that book, and it was great to discuss that with students because you have uh, this, the whole villages, you know, communities where people, and it's for a lot of reasons. If you've seen the movie, or you've read the book, you know what I'm talking about, I won't ruin it for you if you haven't, but people are just robots. Yeah. They either act like robots. No or mindfulness. Robots. There's yeah. no mindfulness. You know, mind, yeah. to me, mindfulness is one of the most important things about being who we are. Being human. And that's what makes us human is some amount of mindfulness. Yeah. But then we end up not being mindful about, you know, those, you know, everything. We should be mindful about everything that we do, feel, all the experiences we have. And we, we miss yeah. that sometimes, you know. Yeah, and you have to exercise your mind to do that at in, in, in the book, it's not giving away. Uh, it's not really a spoiler uh, alert, I guess. But you know, in, in the I don't think they really that that's not part of the movie. But in the story, the original, the book, you find out at some point that the only books that are allowed in the community are what the dictionary, uh, book of rules, and I believe a uh, a book on the architect or the uh, layout of all the buildings in the community basically like tool books yeah you know. every every speaking of nonfiction, right yeah <laughs> every book the only books that anybody really has in the community are those yeah. so there's there's no there's no fiction there's nothing of interest uh, they don't want anybody to learn about anything and, and consequently first and along some other reasons you know people are just robotics and uh, so and that's why it's a popular book because you have that that's that story of you know somebody fighting against the grain and yeah. that, that sort of thing, but I, I really I, I, every time we would read that I would I would be reminded over and over uh, you know and there's a place we learn in the community that that uh, fire is illegal you know because they talk about oh that must have happened back when you could have a fire you know a candle you know in yeah. your house it wasn't considered too dangerous right uh, and I always hoped without bringing up firearms really. I always hope that students would kind of see that parallel. You know, the time came, you know, in this story, this fiction, where it was illegal or you just couldn't have, it's against the rules to have like a fireplace or yeah. to have any fire in the room, a candle, simple yeah. candle, that kind of thing, because it was uh, deemed too dangerous and that sort of thing. So, anyway, yeah, you know, th- those kinds of things, I think, get kids, get youngsters uh, started You're thinking. Interested in, well, yeah, start, yeah, and thinking yeah. about things and, and how the world and, and how you don't want a perfect world. No. You can't have it anyway, and, and you don't want it. Who wants yeah. to live in a perfect world? You know? And and I think one reason, like, thinking about those kind of things and, like, philosophy and all that stuff is important is because it seems to me like the trend that every society has uh, has gone along, at least the ones that we know about, um, is, you know, so let's say a problem. We, have a, we start with a problem that's not created by society. It's just a totally natural problem. Well, once people get together and they figure out some you know, way of, of uh, working around that problem of figuring out something to, to, you know, to take care of that problem. 
And then that solution ends up being a problem itself. So then they're like, oh, well, now we have to come up with another solution to fix that problem that we <laughs> right. cre- use, that, or that solution that we came up with to fix that problem. And then it gets more and more complex and more complex and more complex. And it's this like fractical, fractal mess of all this complexity mm-hmm. when really, if we had just gone back to the original problem and rethought it, we could have avoided all that mess. And societies get more and more fractally complex to the point where they eventually just, at That's least right. historically, they implode. That's right. It's unfixable, basically. Yeah, it's, it's like kind of, computer programs get that way. I was going to say, it's like a spreadsheet. I've, I've made spreadsheets over the years. Those of you who have done that, you know what I'm talking about, where you you know, you set up, build up a simple spreadsheet because you want to track something, and then, you know, oh, it would be a nice way to track this too or do something so you add to it, and you end up with, after, a, what, six or eight different amendments to it, you end up with this jury rig spreadsheet that looks like some kind of Frankenstein thing, and you really just need to start over and redesign it, you know, just like a program, computer program or something. Yeah. <laughs> it's just uh, you need to step back and start over. But, uh, yeah, yeah, that's exactly exactly right. Yeah. And, um, yeah, that, let's see. The last thing that we were going to maybe talk about um, yeah. was, um, was like, and just something we talked about before, of course, is because this is a question that we, we got – you know, forever ago, really, as soon as we got started on most people would ask, you know, like, how do you, uh, you know, do something like that? How do you get involved in this YouTube thing? And, you know, or people would say, oh, I've started making gun videos and all this kind of stuff. What advice do you have? And, you know, and yeah. uh, all these kinds of things. That's you know? right. That's right. I, yeah. I feel like there's like, there's uh, more, you know, uh, mathematical things to consider. And then there's more like fundamental cons- things to consider. And one of the fundamental thing is, is create the type of content, art, whatever you want to call it, that you would want to see. Like if you do that, you can't go wrong, at least on a fundamental level. That's right. Yeah, I've gotten that question a lot. And, uh, you know, I usually just tell them to do, the, do, do what you want to do, what you would enjoy doing, and what you would enjoy seeing yourself, you know, in a video. And you can't go wrong. If you're uh, if you're trying to do this just to make money, well, for one thing, you're not going to make a lot of money. No. You know, I mean, it does. It can pay if you get enough viewers, but it, it you know, you're not going to get rich on YouTube. I don't I don't know if anybody's getting rich on YouTube. There are probably some, maybe, but it's very maybe very a difficult. handful or something. But I mean, you can make some decent money if you got really big. But uh, you know, don't 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 do anything just for the money. But yeah, uh, yeah on on YouTube, because I, I think. I can just read into the questions when I get that. I, you too you probably can see too what they're they're looking for. You know, okay, what they they but read between the lines. You can infer that they uh, there's like a, they think there's they a think trick. That, to exactly. It. They, they okay, John, you and John have figured out there's some secret here. There's some kind of secret, and uh, it's like all those on, weight share, loss tricks, right? Yeah, I'll share <laughs> share it with me. <laughs> share what what okay what is it? You know what. I mean, I mean, not that you know that, that we're like uh, unbelievable or anything. We we have gotten a, gotten a, you know a following and that, that we're proud of. We're so glad you all are out there. But uh, you know, someone that's uh, crank along, decided to do some videos, and you know they got five subscribers, and you know, and they see we have so so many viewers and subscribers. They're thinking, okay, these guys have the answer. Somewhere along the way, they figured it out. What 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 is it? What they do? And they're usually not familiar with the videos. They're not extremely familiar. They probably haven't seen all the videos or whatever it is. Or they don't even know that much about maybe the, the firearms community or the shooting hobby or the sports. And so they maybe just don't have much insight, uh, I don't know, into it. But but anyway, we I think we both probably give them about the same advice. And that's all we can say. Just do what you like to do. And and if people like it, they'll they'll – you know, it'll, it'll grow and it, it won't grow fast, but it'll grow and depends on what your goal is. If your goal is to get as many people to see what you're doing, I don't know. You can, you can kind of sell yourself out if you're not careful. There, there, I think there, there, there are too many people probably on YouTube uh, trying to do a viral video or, or, yeah. there, or too many people, on, not on YouTube, but there's too many people on the planet. I think it's almost become a religion, hasn't it? Just how could I create a viral video yeah not but one I, that accomplishes anything oh yeah it makes the world better just just yeah. one that gets them lots of attention yeah and the media justifies think, their existence by a yeah. bunch of people they're like oh there's that one guy that uh you know got his cat to do that one thing you yeah. know <laughs> yeah. in the media of course propagates you got 
you know, every time you turn on the news or someone, oh, there's a video and it's going viral, you know, or this guy, this video is going to be viral because, or, you know, this person, uh, you know, they threw their dog up on the roof and it jumped off and, and into the truck. I don't know what it yeah. is. And but some it's of those some, videos can flavor our life in a positive way. And they're funny you know? and, yeah, they, maybe they are interesting. Someone caught somebody doing something that was amazing. Or, of course, now the, the trend or the, the cute babies or the cute well, cats are always big, but yeah. like the, the youngsters, you know, riding in the car seat, singing along with the radio. Yeah. Or whatever it ever, be. Ever I'm since, about to get weary of that. Yeah. Ever since uh, was it David after Dennis? You know, then it's all like anyone. Uh, you know, they'll, they're everyone's trying to film their kids. Yeah, you know, doing something <laughs> know. crazy. You know? One of my concerns about this all along, uh, I guess, a little off topic, is is just this: the fact that so many people are dying to have something get really big on YouTube. It's probably getting people killed for one thing. Yeah. People jumping off a roof. To, land on top of their car whatever they might do a somersault and land in the back seat of their convertible something that would be so dramatic that they they just know it'd get a million views and they're they're putting themselves at risk and doing stupid stuff you know that's yeah. dangerous part of it shows like again the cultural problem with how so many people they feel powerless they feel like they have no power and unless they um, can can achieve some sort of fame or notoriety or be known yeah, yeah. by everyone, then that justifies you know their existence, their existence. or their life or something. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's one of the ironic things. I don't think either one of us was looking for that. You know, no. that's what's funny because I we looked at it more like, oh, we have this ability to uh, yeah. provide some people with something they might find interesting. Let's do that. Yeah, like, you know? why not? <laughs> and then as soon after that, you know, people liked it, and then it became like, oh, maybe we can do help, kind of help the Second Amendment by shedding. Yeah. a good light on guns so like early on we were really careful about mm-hmm. about that because uh and our, our mission kind of evolved to the point where i think you agree that you know it's second amendment first and foremost yeah you know we consider in, in a way we i almost consider us a second amendment rights organization no oh, yeah. we're just not active in the sense that we're not going out there and knocking on doors or anything but we but the second amendment is like I mean, to me, our, and I think you two are biggest driving force. That's right. It's and, more indirect and and possibly more effective than being direct. Right. And then after that, information. We want to put out yeah. quality information and make sure that people know what it, the information is. That's a, I think that's really important. You know, anyone can put out information, but it's important to put out information that people they know exactly what that information is, what they're getting. You know, in the right. sense of it being like unbiased, or if it is biased, they know what that bias is and where it right. comes from. Exactly. Um, yeah, that's primary. The primary focus because we don't, we don't ever want to try to fool the viewers, and we never, never really have unless it's some sort of joke, right? Yeah, exactly. We <laughs> so, love to fool them, and that's yeah. It. So we, we, you know, that's that's not a part of what uh, what we're about. Yeah. That's almost to a fault because I know because uh, people yeah. aren't going to believe you a lot of times when right. you're totally honest and transparent. But yeah. you know what? You got to start the trend somewhere. You yeah. know, I mean, people don't trust when you try when you try to be transparent. They don't trust you because most people aren't. And then a lot of people use that as a cop out. Well, I might as well not tell the truth because nobody else does. <laughs> well, then, then that cycle continues. Someone's yeah. got to start doing it. You know, that's true. And it's mainly again, it is that troll in the basement that uh, envious troll or whatever it might be that that uh, is such a doubting Thomas. But uh, yeah, it's so funny when a doubting know, Thomas. It, I don't think I've heard that. Yeah, before. yeah, but, <laughs> no. yeah I, I think that comes from the Bible. I may be wrong. You always come up with these sayings like this. <laughs> I'm like I've spent an insane amount of time with you, and I've never I've, I've never heard you say it ever, and it just comes out of nowhere. <laughs> the, uh, but uh, yeah, you know, people think they'll you'll see a comment, so they'll just know. And to this day, I still get that comment uh, that that I'm getting paid by Glock, you know, oh, or whatever yeah. stuff that, you know, and it, I mean, it's to the point where it doesn't bother you, of course, now, but because we know what we're doing and, and uh, we always, you know, keep it all pretty much up front. And because uh, at the end of the day, the only thing that really matters is how yeah. we feel about yeah, it. Yeah, that's yeah. right. We know what we're doing. And, and yeah, we, we don't try to put anything over anybody. It's it's so funny. But, uh yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. Again, on on topic, I guess. Uh, yeah, that's that's all that I think that that we can encourage people to do is to not worry so much about a viral video, which you're probably not going to get. It's that same old deal. It's just like the more you worry about getting a date, the less likely you are to get get the date. Yeah. You know, the harder you try to impress that that hot blonde, uh, probably the the less chance you're gonna have of getting her to go yeah. out with desperate you know. is basically like never a good thing yeah it's know? just that's just a universal truth and 
and uh, the, the, we're still surprised by uh, sometimes a video will get a lot more views than another. Well, that's surprising. You know, we, we don't ever shoot for that. Yeah. You know, any more than you know, anybody does. We obviously enjoy getting interesting firearms and, you know, that, that yeah. try to make it entertaining and well, educational. Yeah. But you know. a lot of times a video that we think is going to do well, there'll be videos we'll put a lot of effort into. Yeah. Like the one where uh, we shot 50 watermelons with that full auto mm-hmm. AR. Yeah. It's not even really that high on our top right list like some random thing right. you know like the kiapa just blows it out of the water yeah you know i mean just so, so you just never know so yeah. you, you better again that's even more reason and uh, there's another universal truth just do what you like doing just do yeah. it and do it try to do it well and the way you want to do it and let it go with that and, and most of you know the of course we don't really have viral videos much we we uh we, but at least with that one but yeah we've had a few but we it's never intentional it's uh we've just we've just we're kind of like the rabbit and the the tortoise i guess we've just cranked along for uh these years and we put together a library of videos and so we're not worried about that we have a viral video every week if you add up the views you on all the views which is the same thing and that's and i think that's like yeah the message we want to tell people if you're thinking about doing this is be the tortoise, not the hare. Yeah. You know, figure out first sit around and think, okay, what am I interested in? You know, what, what kind of things do I like? Okay. Now what are those things do I like? Uh, what, like, what can I, how can I, um, bring something that has to do with those things to the world? That's a little different than maybe hasn't been done before. It hasn't yeah. been done in the same way that I would like to do it yeah. and then just do it and then do it and, and make yourself your own audience. That was what we did early on mm-hmm. and we still do it but we, you know we've done it so long we don't have to as much but but i would always uh watch the videos and pretend like i was the audience yeah. and i would try to be objective about it. you know be your own audience mm-hmm. and do the kind of videos that you would like to do that's the only way for it to be genuine that really is the only way to to yeah. produce genuine you know content or art or whatever it is is to do what you would want to do uh, because if you're trying to chase trends of like mm-hmm. you know what's popular what other people are doing it's never going to be genuine and it's like playing the stock market you never know what that's right know. that's true and not only do videos the the way you would want to watch them is what you're saying yeah you know, like these mm-hmm. you'd like to see uh, we have or I have the added handicap but I don't even really want to even from the beginning I don't really enjoy doing doing a video if it's not enjoyable right. you know, john will vouch for that there are times when we we're going to do a certain gun or do something a certain way and i i just wasn't in the mood to do that gun or in the mood to to do it that way even and he's the same way you got to do you got to do it the way you want to do it too that's that's very important yeah the way you feel like like maybe in some videos i i shoot too much or maybe i talk too much or whatever and I, and there are that is some of the you know things i've gotten better about about talking too much although i don't apologize for talking a lot in the videos especially nowadays i think, I think some we're of the, done the really early videos yeah. there were two or three where i i have watched uh, i thought oh my gosh turn this guy off but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh you, you just have to do what you like doing and and, and I, there's probably i do that to a fault sometimes uh where maybe it wouldn't be it would be better video or be better cinema if I did it a different way, but I wouldn't enjoy doing the video as much. If this makes any sense, I guess it falls under that same thing. Just got to do the things you want to do. And then if people don't like it, they don't like it. If they like it, they like it. It's just, yeah. a, just the way it is, but be yourself. I think people want to see people, you know, like John says, being authentic, uh, you know, whatever that is. And, and if you, you know, are being genuine in the way that you produce your content or art, yeah. then when it, if it is successful, then you'll know exactly what to do. That's the yeah, cool thing about it. Yeah, really. You we, know, don't to, we don't have to fake anything. Yeah, that's the cool thing about it. If you're doing something because you think it's a trend or you just had some idea that you think might sell, yeah. and you do that and then it's successful, well, that's kind of scary because then you, you don't really know how to keep that going because yeah. it was kind of luck. That's but if right. you're doing what you really want to do, that's easy. You know, right. Just keep like, doing it. It's like know? telling lies or something. You get caught yeah, up in your lies. You exactly. Gotta, and depending on what you're doing, you know, you don't want to get too caught up in the gear and all that stuff. Yeah, you know, just focus on something that's meaningful and that you're that people, you know, you, you think would like and that you enjoy doing, and you know, you, you might be surprised. Yeah, you know? it's the, it's about the content. You know, be competitive with your gear. Yeah. You know, it's like with anything. If you don't have good enough gear to even be competitive, then you're gonna be you're gonna fall behind. Yeah, if it looks you like know? you're looking through a cloud to see your video, yeah. you wouldn't want that. But 
But having the best gear isn't going to ensure that you're going to be the best. A lot of times, right. you you know, that's something that you see. A lot of times, the least talented of any type of group, whether it's you know shooting <laughs> yeah. sports or basketball, whatever it is, a lot of times, or even in a band, the least mm-hmm. talented you know person has the best stuff. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's so right. I've seen that my whole life, and in the shooting sports, it was always funny. And I was always I don't know, kind of a, a weird sort of dude. I I enjoyed. Uh, going to shooting matches with just stock stuff you know a glock or 1911 had hardly anything done to it and then competing in open class or uh again if you go back to my accuracy our accuracy video it's actually called accuracy it, it comes down to just you and what you're doing much more than any equipment yeah. and uh, whether it's a firearm or a guitar you know if i could if i could buy my way into being a great guitarist you know like you know, can't though yeah know. exactly <laughs> yeah so, so yeah, i don't just, know what you think we've rambled enough yeah i think we probably have <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah in a nutshell though basically just just do what you would want to do yeah you know that's that's the main point of all that yeah really and then and then you'll i mean i don't know about you all can y'all hear me out there yeah i don't know about you all out there but i would rather have whatever i'm doing if, if it's a choice between having uh five thousand viewers on a video versus 100,000 viewers. I'd, I'd rather have 5,000 viewers who enjoyed what I'm doing. You know, I yeah. mean, or that, well, that didn't make sense. At what point was I trying I, to Well, I'd have got what I, you meant. I'd but. rather, I'd, yeah, I'd rather, I'd rather be doing what I enjoy doing. Yeah, here's And not my, be what, a chore. Yeah, I'd yeah. rather be doing what I really enjoy doing uh, and have fewer viewers. That's what I was trying to say. Yeah been rambling too long then then do something fake like yeah. you were saying it's there. like that with the jobs too like yeah you know some people we like we tend to want to work jobs that we don't like just because we make it, more money make, and we can get more status right you know which is crazy which is just like that um you know i can't for some reason i can't say this enough but it's just like that mitch hepberg joke where he, he makes a joke about how he was uh working with a charity they were trying to raise uh, they were trying to raise money so they could buy a machine that would tell them how much money they had raised. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> you know, I mean that like that. That's what happens in society. You know, oh, we man. get in these these weird cycles where it's like, wait a minute, we're trying to do something that we, mm-hmm. we didn't even have to do in the first place. That's you know, right. yeah, it's that old that concept of inertia. It's hard to change something, and uh, that's why we we need to question things, question everything, and yeah, and mindfully and be mindful, yeah, yeah. because inertia just keeps things going, whatever it is. Uh, yeah. and there's 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 nothing sacred about something just because it's old or it's been operating along the way it's always been operating. That yeah. that doesn't mean it's like the best, and it doesn't also it also doesn't mean it needs to be changed just because it's been working that way for a long time you know, we got you got two sides to that you know i've been yeah. in businesses and i was in the public industry i've been in a lot i've done a lot of different things and a lot of them i can't talk about because i was in a, a far away place with lots of armament oh is that when you were in the delta seals <laughs> yeah it's just kidding <laughs> yeah <laughs> but uh yeah i mean there's always people that want to change something and you go what's that line about well that's the way we've always done it you know and there are the people who always hate that line because in in business or wherever you're doing you know there are things that have been done a certain way oh that's what we've always done. so they make fun of the fact that that's the way you've always done it so it needs to be changed you idiot you yeah you crusty well sometimes it is the best way to do it that's why that's why it's still being done that way but then lots of times it's just being done that way because it's always been done that way, yeah. and it is inertia. You know, yeah. to, uh, well, it's like people question the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and stuff. Yeah, you know, I think people have a, a weird sense of that, and they think that like, okay, a bunch of guys just got together and just came up with that off the top of their heads. But really, in reality, like the Constitution, all that kind of stuff was was built from pieces of like ancient knowledge over a long yeah, time. It's, it's not like they all just came up with that fresh. Right. Like those are bits and pieces from past societies of things that worked and didn't work. Based on a lot of experience and a lot of intelligence. And history yeah. and deep, deep, far back history, you yeah. know. And there are, I mean, we're running short. We're, we're, we probably just have four hours left here. But <laughs> yeah, but yeah, and that's, that's the thing. People want to, just because something is really, really common or it's really, really old, you know, the other side of that is they want to throw it out or yeah. change it or, or think it's stupid or just same old thing. And we've talked about this before. 
my gosh, what's the best press? Everybody uses Dylan. Oh, well, I want to use something different. Everybody yeah. carries a Glock. Oh, well, uh, that's stupid. I want to carry something. I want to be different. Or, you know, and it doesn't have to be Glock, but, uh, you know, I'm biased there. But if there are a lot of people. There's a lot of. Uh, it's like blindly counterculture is yeah, kind of what it is. Yeah. If, if you have a reason for, for using something different, yeah. do it. But and it may be, it may be that, I mean, sometimes that happens. You know, something is really popular and it's not good you know like the right. like the beats uh, headphones mm-hmm. they're good headphones but they're not like like good headphones you know what yeah, i'm saying so advertising so and it's the, mostly marketing that. yeah you know so like with that that would be a, a actual uh, situation where you would go oh yeah look at look at those you know i want something different because there's those, probably something better right? those are all hype you know but yeah. then some things aren't aren't just fabricated hype they actually are do have the reputation they do because they are really good or one of the best or because something. Yeah. thousands or even millions of individuals have decided that man those really work yeah and that's why you see a lot of it what you know and so that's the situation yeah and of course i, I would use glock as an example because it probably is the best example of firearms you know yeah. every cop seems to carry one and all that so it's easy to see why somebody would just uh, take the other approach and i have that tendency myself yeah. if i see everybody doing something yeah i question it then and there are things because most not, people are yeah. not most people well it sound negative but he, a lot of people don't think yeah. very deeply you yeah. know so whatever the mass of people are following you know i tend to yeah. question you know so so it'd be easy to do that with a glock yeah. for example and there are things to not like about glocks yeah but to me it's kind of irrational when people act like they're like the worst handgun and all the hype is just strictly manufactured you know, right, like yeah. the hype about Glocks is not manufactured. That I can right. be sure about. You can debate whether they're a good handgun or not, but it, it's not right. manufactured. The hype does come from a large amount of people agreeing upon the fact that they are really good handguns. Right. You might disagree with that, which is totally legitimate, completely legitimate, but it's not a manufactured hype. No, especially when, uh, in, in that particular ex- uh, case, the more experienced the shooter tends to be, the more they are going to like a Glock. They may not carry one, they may not love them, but uh, it's been my experience that the the folks who who shoot at the highest levels, uh, serious gun carriers, long time experienced gun carriers, uh, those are the people most likely to like a Glock. Yeah, you know, because so, the thing that makes them yeah. that makes them exceptional is the the size. <laughs> a lot yeah. of it is that's right. Is the size, you know, like the. Um, like I pointed out in my Glock sucks video where, of course, lots of people came on there and used it as a forum to trash Glocks. But right. the thing I tried to point out was there's tons of guns out there that match the shootability. Then they, they blow Glocks grip and feel out of the water. They match the reliability and the durability right. and the price and all these kinds of things. The one thing about the Glock that I have not quite seen matched yet is the size and the sleekness of it. Yeah. You know, it's the one thing that they... I don't really match, and that becomes after, of course, you know, near hundred percent reliability. That becomes the most important thing with carry, you know. Right. Yeah. There's a reason that that, that most things are are popular. Uh, there are. It's not some things. It is just marketing. Some things are manufactured popularity. Yeah. yeah, yeah but uh, not everything. Not everything. Well, can I laugh for uh, in honor of Derek? One. Yeah. Time? That's right. <laughs> yeah. That's I, mean, I can't get the laugh. <laughs> that's what my fans have grown to appreciate. That's, what I used <laughs> that's to. right. Yeah. Oh, it's been fun being on with you, John. Uh, uh, Sometimes we have to come on with Derek. Uh, we'll get all, yeah, we'll all three go. of us. It'd be fun. Oh, yeah. That would be good. We'd yeah. probably keep it down to four hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, in the meantime, I'll just wonder why John Lennon's wearing a white suit on yeah. the Abbey Road cover yeah. as I watch him cross the road there. Yeah, and why they replaced Paul McCartney with someone better because I like their later <laughs> stuff actually better than their early yeah, stuff. That's right. I Actually, I think that uh, – that John and uh, George are still alive. They're being kept alive somewhere in a cave in North Dakota, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I think so, too. That's Actually, right. I, I think you're Paul McCartney. You just had facial reconstructive <laughs> surgery. I, got, did, I could use some of that. But. You got tired of the fame and yeah. you know, the lifestyle. But, again, I, uh, uh, before you sign off, uh, thank all of the viewers for, for watching and uh, the couple of listeners would actually listen to us ramble and, and I all think there's that. anyone still listening by this point? Yeah, I doubt it. I doubt <laughs> it in the – we appreciate you all and, uh, and everybody that supports us. You know our yeah. our our, our, uh, our sponsors. We don't have many, but you know we've got we've got a few people that help us. And uh, budsgunshop dot com. Yeah, they good to us. Yeah, federal and uh, you know Elks Outdoors helps us get guns in. And who else helps us? Uh, forget somebody, don't we always do? 
We have uh, a lot of people help us in, in uh, other ways, you know, small Psychiatrists. Ways. Yeah, the psychiatrists that uh, see me every evening and try to keep me online. But uh, yep. but anyway, we appreciate you all listening. And I uh, can't believe you do and watch, but uh, we'll keep talking and we'll keep shooting as long yep. as you do. Oh, also, I keep forgetting to plug. I, I created a, a Hickok 45 and Son Facebook pretty long time ago. or a fair oh, yeah. one. I keep forgetting to plug it. You know, a lot of people, they plug the stuff all the time, but I just, like, I forget to plug it. Yeah. So I do have a Hickok 45 and Son uh, Facebook. Facebook. Okay. Uh, now, the only problem is is it'll be just like the radio shows. It's not going to be good. But <laughs> I feel like I should at least let people know that it's there. You know? Well, if you keep me off there, maybe it'll be good. Yeah, that's so. true. Well, good visiting with you, John. Yep. Yeah, we don't see much of each other. So Yeah, really, really. <laughs> Poor kid. Gosh, just think about it. A lot of young men a lot of children you know they grow up and they go off to california or somewhere else they don't have to put up with their family they don't have to put up with their dad they their get mom. to get away from them you know <laughs> right. they don't have to always be around them all you the time. just never could get too far away from the range right i know yeah oh well and maybe maybe in my next life i'll be able to get away from my parents you know? that's right you'd be a gun <laughs> hater in your next life that's right anyways appreciate you guys uh checking out the show and um as i told you at the beginning uh that other radio show that i actually recorded a week ago i'll get that one up sometime and i'll let you know that that's what it is um in the little pref- preface uh preface that i do uh i forgot how to pronounce that word for some reason but uh and uh so anyways i appreciate you guys for listening and uh we'll talk to you next time dad's making noise over there <laughs> see you